Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Godfrey Worsdale, director of the Henry Moore Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. It's, uh, for me, it's quite a special conversation that we're going to have today, and I'm, I'm quite excited to hear our speakers and, and from you all um, to kind of collect perspectives on, on Henry Moore in this particularly interesting decade. I've been with the Foundation for seven years now, and when I, when I came into post, I, I was interested. I'm not a Moore scholar. Moore's always been a really important artist to me, but I've never professed to be a, an academic expert in Moore. But I think I've always been intrigued by the kind of centrality and importance that Moore's played in the wider um, uh, British art scene in the, in the modernist era, and obviously the impact that he had internationally. And when I, when I became director of the foundation that Moore established, I, I, I was interested to kind of test my feelings for Moore with my new expert colleagues in the field and people I met in and around the, the kind of the Moore circle, people who knew Moore in his lifetime, which I never did, um, people who spent their academic careers studying Henry Moore. Try and get some consensus about what it was that, that, when it was that Moore was really important, really vital. And there was undoubtedly, um, a few years ago anyway, this consensus around the 1930s. And I felt, I felt sort of included in that because I'd been very excited by what Moore was doing in the 1930s. And it lent on the 20s, of course. But really, the 1930s is when Henry Moore radically, powerfully contributes to the development of modernism. He's very much a feature. He's understood as a functioning, important element of the European avant-garde in, in more than one important way. By the 90, my 1937 is in Picasso's studio when Guernic has been made. I think we can all accept that that important kind of recognition for a British artist that had probably never ever been before was, was very much a part of Henry Moore's makeup. And then quite significantly, the Second World War starts and it brings a period of art history to a, a shuddering halt in a way and that certainly applied to the trajectory of Moore's art and the, the way he worked and the way he lived and he came here. Um, and the practice changed according to the context he was living in. Um, he became a war artist, as you all know, and quickly that led to his, I sometimes hear the phrase, national treasure status. He stopped being a kind of cavalier in the avant-garde in many perceptions and became something important to the British spirit and the British personality. And he became a father. So parenthood, moving to Aurora Little, his undoubted um, acclaim both within the art world and beyond, could have been a moment for many artists where they reached a point in their career where things can, momentum's now sufficiently in place to see him through the rest of his career. And when the war ended and all those accolades had been received and recognised, in a way, you could make a leap, I think, to the very end of Moore's life. He could, more or less, have repeated himself for a while and very gradually ease himself into those lovely sheet drawings that he made in his dotage. That could have happened. Because he's, by the 50s, you know, he's well into his middle age. And in Moore's generation, you were expecting about three score years and ten. That, that was, for people born at the beginning of the 20th century, that's really what you anticipated you were going to get. And that's why I find today's event and Hannah's exhibition looking at the 1960s so remarkable because through the 50s as the center of gravity in the art world shifts from Europe from Paris to New York as the emigre European artists move en masse to New York at a point where America becomes the dominant world force economically commercially and in terms of the art world and there is this explosion of power of scale that comes through the 50s and reaches this grandiose moment in the 1960s, when, as I say, Henry Moore could have slid into a very, very comfortable position in the European art world. 
But really interesting for me as the 50s are moving on, more is connecting with that power, with that energy, with that scale. The American market, the American museums, are buying into what Henry Moore's doing, and he's becoming more and more global and more and more present in that world. And so by the time we reach the 60s and the scale of the, uh, the power of the abstract expressionist, more is in tune. And for those of you, and I'm hoping you've all seen the exhibition, no, you certainly will um, today if you haven't, the scale, the ambition, the power, the bravado that Henry Moore is able to wield with such um, ex extreme composure and control that it is recognized by the, the New York art scene as being part and parcel of the best, most ambitious activity in the world. And, and really, my, my overriding sense that I need to kick myself and remind myself of when walking around Hammer's show is that by the end of this period of time, Henry Moore is 71, 72 years of age. And to me, that, even now, is pretty remarkable. But back in the 60s, this old man, as he must have been perceived by the artistic fraternity, is exhibiting this remarkable energy, this remarkable influence, this remarkable confidence that resulted in this body of work that, as you all know, is seen across across the globe. In, in Europe alone, there are maybe 50 commissions that Moore delivers on a grand scale. The monumental bronze becomes this new kind of icon that is, in a way, replaces the shelter drawings of the way that the public know more. And they recognize him internationally as well as, as, well in, the, as in the UK. And I find all that really, really fascinating and remarkable on a personal level, on, a, on the level that this person did these things. It's remarkable. And the way that it exists within the context of 1960s art history is really, really exciting and fascinating to me. On the back of the fact that there's a younger avant-garde pushing and challenging more status as well. So I'm very excited to hear what our speakers have got to share today. And I, I look forward very much to, to hearing more. But before I make way, I do want to thank very much Hannah I am Dr. Hannah I am for thinking of doing this exhibition. I'm so glad you did. And Sylvia as well. It's such an achievement to have mm. delivered that for us. And it's been something I desperately wanted to see. And it's been an education now. I've seen it. And I'd also like to thank Tom as well for taking the reins and organising us all today. Um, so I hope you all have a lovely day. I hope you have a chance not only to join the tour and see the exhibition, but to enjoy the grounds. And, um, and after today, we've got a little period of time before the exhibition closes and Perry Green closes for the winter season. So please do uh, encourage um, your friends and colleagues to try and get here, because I think this is an important exhibition that, that people need to see. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Hannah to take us through the day. Thank you. Uh, Godfrey and uh, I'd like to reiterate Godfrey's thanks to all of you for uh, coming today, for attending um, this conference which as he says is important to us and important um, for me personally as well in thinking about all of those um, themes and ideas that uh, Sylvia who um, sort of co-curated the show with me um, was sort of generating you know over a year ago now and really kind of wanting to explore those things further. Um, I should mention um, that many of you may be expecting Margaret Garlake this morning. Um, I'm uh, unfortunately for some uh, stepping into her shoes. She's had to uh, withdraw, but um, we will miss Margaret um, greatly. Um, welcome to the first session of the day. Um, like this afternoon, we're going to hear three papers uh, this morning from three speakers. Um, and then once all of those three speakers have um, given their papers, we will um, take questions from the audience and have a panel discussion um, and reconvene. So if you can save up your uh, questions for that moment, that would be fantastic. Um, this morning's panel is titled um, A Different Landscape, More Technology, uh, uh, More Nature and Technology. Um, and as Godfrey sort of hinted at, the 1960s, of course, is this era defined by these seismic um, advances in science, technology, global communication, 
Um, and for many, this demanded a kind of re-evaluation of the relationships between human nature and the world in which we were living, or they were living. Um, and one of our aims in this panel was to sort of explore that context in which Moore was working in the decade, in light of those developments, and in light of the artistic responses that others were making to those um, developments. And so with that in mind, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of the day, which is Jonathan Vernon, who is Associate Lecturer at the Courtauld Institute of Art. Uh, John's recent uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the Metropolitan Museum in New York was supported by the no less glamorous Henry Moore Foundation, um, <laughs> uh, and it examined the uh, sculptural practices in Britain during the 1960s through the lens of what he describes as the Brancusi paradigm, um, a way of thinking about form and how sculpture um, could shape the world. So there's no better uh, way, perhaps, than to start our conference uh, entitled uh, Shaping the Future That Was. Uh, today, John's particular focus is humanism, humanity, um, and such as it might be figured in sculpture during this period, characterised, of course, as we said, by social, political and cultural change. So, John, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank Hannah and Tom for the invitation for their work on this um, and the Henry Moore Institute for funding off the research behind this paper. I'd also like to thank Rob Sutton, who can't be here today, whose paper at the Henry Moore Foundation conference last year um, caused me to try and think again about Moore's humanism. I'll start. The final part of Adam Curtis's 1995 documentary, The Living Dead, examines how Margaret Thatcher summoned a ghost of Britain's past, the Blitz spirit, to generate popular support for her political vision. This gave public sculpture a significant role in building a new and glorious image of the nation's past. One of Mrs Thatcher's aims was to generate a new sense of pride in Britain's past. For over 30 years, monuments to the country's greatness had lain discarded. They had been replaced by modern sculpture. Now that was all to change. The supporters took up the challenge. One evening I was uh, standing on one of the uh, gates just over there and uh, I wondered why we have a spotlight on King George V when a man I think of national importance down in the square should have the same treatment. Sir Winston Churchill. Bearing in mind he was the right man in the right place at the right time. And I thought, well, this is definitely not on. Hello? And the next thing I know, I've got a letter in my tray saying, you know, well done. I think your idea is brilliant and all this business, or worse to that effect. And, um, hey, presto, the light appeared. It was all due to you. Well, yes, I, I think yes, I think it was, definitely. Um, well, it was. There was no, there's no, there's no question about it. Today, we are more likely to picture the Churchill Monument in Parliament Square as a site of protest. <coughs> but though the back statue bears the mark of repeated exorcisms, its spectre is still with us, still watched over by police officers, and still able to compel preposterous acts of devotion. And our subject here is the past and future represented by the other, even more spectral presence lurking in the shadows of Curtis's film, the slide. Moore's Knife Edge 2 piece of the early 1960s. This version is stalled in 67. Moore's sculpture has been part of the backdrop to countless interviews with MPs and political broadcasts on College Green. But I think its unacknowledged presence in this footage accesses a truth about the vision of abstraction it embodies. The truth is this, the belief that there is something fundamental, universally legible and life enhancing in a particular language of abstraction, and the underlying belief that a shared humanity exists and can be articulated, did not survive the 20th century. The power of that vision has dissipated. If Churchill is a vengeful revenant, Knife Edge Two Piece is a wandering spirit. That's not to say that more sculptures do not compel their own deeply felt responses slightly. 1,200 students at Columbia University protested against the installation of a reclining figure in 2016. 
public sculptures by more across the UK, including here at Pearl Green, have been stolen, elsewhere melted down and disfigured, as well as touted for sale by local councils. While these are not all ideological acts, I don't think they're wholly unrelated. The protests suggest a lapsed faith in the capacity of institutions to speak from and to our collective experience, and a real scepticism of any representation of the human that claims to transcend difference. The thefts, petty vandalism and fire sales are symptomatic, each in their own way, of a weakened state, a squeezed and shrinking public square, and a state of mass disillusion. This is to say that the problem faced by more sculpture is a political problem, one I would crudely pass like this. The animus of these works is a particular form of humanism, a constant in Moore's work that connects the multi-part figures to the abstractions, the carvings to the bronzes, unit one and circle to the work of the 60s. That humanism, or a rarefied rhetorical impression of it, provided the ideological justification for a technocratic liberalism that has, since the 1960s, progressively surrendered its political power and command over public space. It is now outflanked and battled and discredited on both the left and the right, and so too is the very idea of a common humanity. We tend to identify Moore's humanism exclusively with his representations of the figure. But a focus on Moore's work in the 1960s, as seen in the current exhibition at Perry Green, presents us with the opportunity to challenge this assessment. Works like Knife Edge Two Piece show that in the post war era, Moore continued to find aesthetic answers to ethical questions in the language of abstraction. Sorry. Moreover, they suggest that his humanism continued to follow the model set out so vividly in Circle, International Survey of Constructive Art, back in 1937, or in Herbert Reed's writings on art, education, and anarchism. In short, Moore retained the belief, as he put it in Circle, that abstraction was, quote, an expression of the significance of life, a stimulation to greater effort in living. The constructive idea was that abstraction provided a means to access the fundamental conditions of human cognitive and emotional life, and a root out of modernity's image world, its unceasing reproduction of meaning and entrenched forms of power. Skepticism as to the radical potential of this idea by the 1960s was inextricable from the criticism faced by Moore for his apparent coziness with the establishment. John Berger argued repeatedly that the problem of Moore's sculpture was a lack of figuration, a failure to attain any real purchase on the world. Works like the UNESCO reclining figure were, for Berger, objects caught in the act of, quote, striving to become an image. And it is surely this sense of Moore's work as a perceived reflection of the inertia, inarticulacy, and emptiness of an establishment culture whose humanism is purely symbolic that best captures the least charitable attitudes to his work today. The question asked by this paper is what it really meant to produce humanist sculpture in Britain during the 1960s. Its premise is that we can provide better answers to this question by not invoking the spirit of post-war reconstruction that propelled more and figure sculpture more generally to prominence in the 1950s. Rather, we might adopt the sculptor's own view, offered at the UNESCO conference, The Artist and Modern Society in 1952, that he belonged to, quote, a transitional age. A transitional age, not only between economic and social orders, but between conceptions of the human, beliefs about what sculpture was for, and valuations of modernist ideas about the world. What this transitional moment demands is renewed emphasis on the expansive, difficult, and contradictory forms taken by humanism both in British sculpture and the wider culture in the 1960s. We need to understand how those forms relate to the fundamental tension mapped out by Berger, and that was present in Moore's work, between image and object, figuration and abstraction, reference and self-reference. To do this, I want to carve out a space for more within a field of sculptural inquiry to which he normally occupies a relation structural position, that of the new generation sculptor. Following Toby Julius' assessment of the new generation as, quote, the uncomfortable and highly compromised transition point between the 1950s and the 1970s, I want to suggest that abstract sculpture of this period 
can be broadly understood as a belated, protracted and conflicted reconciliation with the end of the vision encapsulated in circle. That is, the notion that there is an inherent freedom and vitality to the human spirit, internal forces that abstraction could uniquely access, was no longer sustainable. Instead, abstraction's relation to the human depended on its externality, its otherness, its out-thereness, visible in the new generation's trademark applied colour and that mixture of matte and reflective surfaces. Above all, the new generation's humanism was about sculpture taking its place within a visual culture and material world in which a kind of freedom still seemed possible. A work of larger scope than this would expand on the cultural conditions underlying this difficult renegotiation. But even a brief recounting of humanism's own internal contradictions in this period throws the problems faced by sculpture into sharp relief. In short, the 60s was the decade in which humanism truly became an effective establishment force. For example, the newly founded British Humanist Association led robust campaigns for civil rights, gay rights, abortion, the right to euthanasia. But the belief that a sufficient system of ethics, meanings, and truths could be derived from a purely secular world also coincided with a new form of individualism. This was visible not only in consumer culture and politics, but in humanistic psychology, which suggested, as in Maslow's famous hierarchy, that human behavior was fundamentally uniform, predictable, and malleable under the right environmental conditions. This was an altogether new version of the human, vision of the human and the social world, a world to which sculpture would have to accommodate itself anew. It's difficult to speak about the new generation without addressing its own reputation and issues. The literature is palpably weighed down by narratives of succession. The new generation often appears caught between patricides, usurping more with the dagger of conceptualism already planted in its back. This sort of art history can be difficult to take seriously, but it would be true to say that the new generation's issue was in part its lateness, its renegotiation of sculpture's scale, the mode of address and occupation of space, at just the moment the material object came to be seen as art's central problem. Julius' account argues against the perception that the new generation was a small provincial art and seeks instead to emphasize its, quote, confidence at a time when British sculpture was treated as an art of international significance. His case in point is the preemptory reserve and self-sufficiency of the early new generation sculpture included in primary structures, the 1966 exhibition that brought minimalism to wider consciousness. But confidence is also intrinsic to the problem posed by the new generation. As Judith also notes, its practitioners were the children of the British Empire, an empire in its final act. Unlike both Moore and the conceptualists, they were mostly born in the colonies, upper class and privately educated, as well as white and male. More than that, the new generation's work was the art of an imperious culture. Disciplined, serious about its task, deferential to its forebears, well-read and tightly realised. The sculpture course at St. Martin's, I mean, mm. As it is a phrase. Okay. The sculpture course at St. Martin's, where the new generation were tutored by Anthony Caro and briefly Michael Fried, demanded this seriousness, holding intense surgeries in which the students discussed the art of sculpture as sculpture, its problems, its solutions, its task. The result of this admixture can seem like an art of distance and totality which begs the question of what such an art could have to say about the human. There's more than one answer to this question. The new generation also had a genteel sense of humour and playfulness that narratives of so-called high modernism tend to leave aside. Likewise, the new generation is as arbitrary a grouping as any other, and contemporaries from quite different backgrounds, including women like Kim Lim and Wendy Taylor, had just as much to say to the modernist tradition. My answer here is that this confidence was the outward sign of a visual culture that had become progressively uncertain about the capacity of sculpture to speak to human experience. That is, 
The new generation belonged to a culture in which the prevalence, polyvalence, and multiplication of the image made a representation of humanity as such seem obtainable again, but not through the singular archetypal object, but through the plural transient image. We may think here of Edward Steichen's exhibition Family of Man, which was touring Europe at the time Caro began teaching at St. Martin's. Steichen's mission statement for Family of Man, that photography, quote, is the only universal language we have, encapsulated the real confidence of an emergent and increasingly powerful liberal humanism. Indeed, the shared meanings and values implied by Steichen's claim and the exhibition itself served a clear function for its co-organizers in the US State Department. For the new generation, the question was what in such an image world the difference and distinctness of the art object, not to mention the irreducibility of abstraction, was for. That this was the new generation's problem field is demonstrated in the first two numbers of the St. Martin student magazine first, on which the new generation sculptors Philip King, William Tucker and Tim Scott all had editorial input. Dating from 1961, when they had begun to converge on a distinct sculptural language, first is in fact a key to the tension between object and image at the very heart of the new generation's project and to its understanding of the human. Like the family of man, first number one is above all a highly aestheticized work of anthropology, a document of intense engagement with the capacity of the image and especially the photograph to reveal the differenced but also patterned nature of human experience in the context of late modernity. Its subjects are the human form and its relationships with the structures of its physical and social environment. The human is represented here as the content of culture, the raw component of the enchantment performed by symbolic order and a once vital form now disciplined, homogenized, mass produced. That what's at stake here is the image world of late capitalism is well established by Lawrence Alloway's text, Words on Images, published exclusively in first number one. Alloway's short text contrasts the typographical culture of the Renaissance, in his words, to modernity's fascination with the image, what he calls, quote, a vernacular of things seen. He goes on to say, quote, in the channel of mass-produced visual material, the images you want, colour photographs of Jupiter, wide-angle shots of Manhattan Island, all these images have ruptured the typographical space of the Renaissance page. However, the image is not a visual aid towards a verbal truth. It is a constituent of the abundance characteristic of the 20th century, in which the same person can be a consumer of garret art, fashion magazines, and comic strips. Alloway's point is that an image-based culture is consumer culture. The spectator is the consumer. And the conditions of spectatorship are their capitalism itself. This is what lay beneath the liberal humanism of the family of man. The truth that for Steichen's universal language to be comprehensible required a shared gaze, shared by capital. And what first number two, the following issue, demonstrates is that the form of the new generation's abstraction was that of a conflicted attempt to negotiate these perceptual conditions. First number two was edited by Tucker, who became a scholar of modern sculpture in his own right and built much of the new generation's theoretical framework from the inside. That framework is already visible in his editorial for the issue, not least in a source that he would return to again and again in late texts, Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition, published three years earlier in 1958. Tucker quotes the following passage in full. Quote, Whatever enters the human world of its own accord or is drawn in by human effort becomes part of the human condition. The impact of the world's reality on human existence is felt and received as a conditioning force. The objectivity of the world, its object or thing character, and the human condition supplement each other. Because human existence is conditioned existence, it would be impossible without things, and things would be a heap of unrelated articles, a non-world, if they were not the conditions of human existence. Tucker, in this piece, declares abstract sculpture to be 
such a non-world, removed from what Arendt called praxis, a world of intersecting interests and agencies in which existing structures of power may be reproduced, but then also through human action be changed. This is the world to which the photographic spreads of first number one gave form. The distance Tucker seeks from it would seem to represent the high modernist project at its most intractable. But first number two is, in its fullness, a document of sculpture's struggle with the terms of its belonging to a social world in the first years of the 1960s. The issue is made up of statements given by Tucker's contemporaries, including a number of new generation sculptors, in response to a survey of their practices, including a question, quote, sculpture has come to be regarded as object. Do you think sculpture should in any way be specially isolated? The answers amount to an insistence that sculptures were neither merely objects nor separable from the world of commodities, but instead modes of reference, cultural products inescapably related to their time, bound up in, um, bound up in the words of sculptor Hugh Vaughan with, quote, Bartok, the films of Ingmar Bergman, jazz, and the face of Elsa Martinelli. By 1969, writing in a special issue of Studio International dedicated to contemporary British sculpture, Tucker agreed. After invoking Aaron's book once again, he set out to show that sculpture had been subject to the same processes of disenchantment that modernity had cast over culture and human experience as a whole. It had, in fact, discovered its objectness, its reality as a, quote, contingent art. In doing so, sculpture gave up its privileged task of monumentalizing the human form as the price of occupying a genuinely human space and time. Tucker's attempt to capture the dimensions of that space and time is at once triumphant and tragic, and so I want to read a long passage in thought, it's rather breathless. Object life constitutes a kind of web or net, overlaying, underlaying, or entangled with the lives of modern urban men. Objects come into being, multiply and divide, change hands, change uses, metamorphose, submerge, emerge, are subject to life and use processes of man, natural processes of wear and erosion, oxidization and decay, gradual and violent change, accident, human design, modification and redesign, families, tribes, nations of objects, simultaneous existence of generations of objects, ancestors and descendants, massed, ordered, dispersed, static or in motion, all in a state of continuous existence, in time and space, constituting a vast process, the complexity of which rivals that of the natural world. What's tragic here, and leads us back to Henry Moore, is that even this strikingly egalitarian positioning of the high modernist object was undone by the new generation's belatedness. Tucker's piece ends by noting that the promise of modern sculpture's materialist revolution had gone unrealized, not least because, quote, there is no public realm in our time to which a public sculpture might give visual purpose. Told in this way, modernism's story was one of resistance and acceptance of a contingent world, only to find that this was a world that didn't have room for modern sculpture anymore. This is my conclusion. Arendt's subject in the human condition was what she called the loss of the world the contraction of the public sphere, the arena of speech and action, in favor of the bare reproduction of our material conditions. Her subject was at once a process of alienation and the forms of action that preserved a sense of possibility of social agency. As I've already made clear, I think this is the right elegiac mode for the broader modernist tradition represented by Moore. The new generation's anxieties were doubtless not his own, but it is enough to say that the tension between object and image, the dialectical movement that gave life to more sculptural language, was also the form in which 60s sculpture imagined its future and staked its existence on a meaningful relationship with the human. The question that persists is whether we can recognize ourselves in that vision of humanity or whether we just see a ghost. Thank you. Thank you, John. Sorry, I'm also now feeling battles. Um, <laughs> that was a fantastic paper. 
um, which I'm sure is going to prompt many questions um, in the, uh, later in the morning. Um, but without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Elizabeth Johnson, <laughs> you are there, um, who is Senior Lecturer in uh, Critical and Contextual Studies um, at the Cambridge School of Art at Andrew Ruskin University. Um, Elizabeth has also held a uh, postdoctoral fellowship with the Henry Moore Foundation based at UCL, uh, during which time she researched um, the figure and, uh, of the monument in contemporary art. Um, so, really, kind of some uh, nice things to see just there. Um, this uh, uh, was uh, followed a fellowship at the Smithsonian and a PhD titled What Do You Call a Sculptor Who Doesn't Make Sculptures? Um, Bruce Nauman, 1965 to 74, at Burbeck College. Um, her current book project investigates how artists use digital technologies to pioneer new socially engaged uh, models of monumentality. Um, and I'm really pleased that today Elizabeth has kind of combined all these strands um, of her research to give us a, t a paper about Bruce Nauman's uh, Light Trap for Henry Moore, which considers Moore's influence on sculpture practice in the late 1960s and more of this tr uh, notion then of uh, tradition and modernity that seemed bound up in Nauman's response to Henry Moore. Um, so, Elizabeth, over to you. <laughs> everyone. Um, so I'd like to start off by saying thank you to Hannah and thank you to Tom for inviting me here today. Um, and so as you've heard, my name is Dr Elizabeth Johnson. Um, and in my research, what I'm really interested in exploring is how the influence of sculpture can be traced in artists' different engagements with new media after the 1960s. So we're really talking about things ranging from holography to um, augmented reality. Um, I want to start by saying I'm not a Henry Moore scholar, um, and so I was slightly surprised to be invited today. Um, so the paper that I want to share with you is not about Henry Moore's work, um, but rather it's a paper about what Moore signified to other artists in this, um, who were forging their professional careers in the 1960s, um, which was a decade, as we know, of really significant change for sculptural practice in Europe and the Americas. Um, what I want to do is use the North American-based artist Bruce Nauman as a lens to kind of uh, think about how Moore might have served as an emblem for the values of modern sculpture at that time, and think about how Nauman might have tried to trap and carry forward some of these values into the next decade. Um, so this is kind of my first aim, is to outline this relationship between Nauman and Moore, and then the second thing that I want to do is think about a lineage um, that links Nauman's really pioneering work with holograms to the sculptural concerns that are emblemized um, in his work by the figure of Henry Moore. Um, and I'm going to do this by focusing on a mini series of photographs that were called uh, Light Trap for Henry Moore, and number one and number two. And I want to show how these photographs create this kind of bridge between um, Nauman's fascination with Moore and these two series of holographic self-portraits um, that he would create later on. The photograph depicts a luminous, diaphanous spiral floating in a pitch-dark room. This single, sinuous loop of light cascades through the darkness, hovering above its reflection on the floor beneath. The form articulated by the spiral is loosely anthropomorphic, a sense that's really heightened by this photograph's scale. It's actually 160 centimetres high. The luminous loops index the movements of a hand as it uses a torch to draw the image in front of a photographic film on a long exposure. Titled Light Trap for Henry Moore No. 1, it was made in 1967 by Bruce Nauman, whose career first rose to prominence in the late 1960s. Why was an artist such as Nam, who was famed for his really eclectic approach to new media, interested in the influential um, English-based sculptor Henry Moore? And what compelled Nam to make a really giant photograph that's reminiscent of the type of seated figure for which Moore's practice was renowned? And then where this reference so boldly in the work's title? And then thinking about this title, what does it mean for Nam to try and trap Moore? <coughs> So let's begin with Nauman's interest in Moore. 
Light Trap for Henry Moore No. 1 is just one in an informal series of sculptures and drawings and photographs that were produced by Norman in 1966 and 1967 that make reference to Moore. Um, for example, seated storage capsule for Henry Moore. This is a kind of pastel and acrylic drawing which depicts this really quite peculiar pink casket that seems to be sitting on a plinth. Um, and it seems to be encasing a seated figure. Not only does this invoke more explicitly through its title, but also um, implicitly through the portrayal of a seated figure. And also many commentators have uh, noted how this formal drawing style seems to recall Moore's, um, uh, sorry, uh, it seems to recall Moore's drawings of um, figures sheltering from the blitz. Uh, perhaps the most well known is the 1967 wax sculpture Henry Moore Bounce Pale Black View. Um, and this is a wall based sculpture that depicts the torso and the upper arm to the figure who's bound with rope and viewed from behind. And I think in this image we can see this really crudely modelled and lump configuration fails to achieve anything like the grace or mastery or even the full three dimensionality of the artist to which it's referring. Um, there's a really vast critical literature on Bruce Norman, and in it there's some uh, standout texts that deal with this relationship between Norman and Moore. Um, the two I'd like to highlight is uh, essays by Joe Aplin and Robert Slifkin. Um, but prior to these very considered retrospective accounts, um, the period commentator and New York Times critic Hilton Kramer, Kramer sorry, misinterpreted Norman's reference to Moore as what he thought of as a straight-up form of mockery. Um, so in his review of Norman's 1973 retrospective at the Whitney Museum in New York, Cranman describes Norman's sculpture Henry Moore Bounce Fail as an amusing historical joke. And he suggests that Norman, and I quote, um, only invokes Henry Moore figures for the purposes of mocking them. So facing a showcase of Norman's diverse practice, Kramer claims that the references to Moore make one yearn for Henry Moore. What I think Kramer's objecting to here was what he's misinterpreted, sorry, it's what he's interpreted as Norman's Duchampian investment in ideas in so-called anti-retinal art. Um, and the conservative critics longing for Moore emerges from a kind of self-imposed critical model um, which is founded on this dichotomy between uh, formal aesthetics on the one hand and the growing conceptualism which he's tracing back to Duchamp. And Kramer's yearning for a very comfortable critical terrain um, of the tradition of modern sculpture in which it is tangible, concrete, three-dimensional objects that are really invested in formal concerns. I think that Kramer's assessment that Naman was simply mocking more is inaccurate. And at stake in these references is a much more nuanced attendance to Moore as a kind of proxy for modern sculpture. Now that made his references to Moore in the late 1960s, which was a period art historian Richard Will Williams claims represents a paradoxical moment in the history of modern sculpture. On the one hand, we've got sculpture and it seems to be at its modern zenith. So in 1967, we have the exhibition American Sculpture of the 60s at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and this was meant to be uh, the most expensive exhibition of sculpture ever mounted at, it, at the time. The same year, we've got Art Forum, and they devote their some special issue all to sculpture. And this uh, issue contains some of the key texts we think of from the era, the things by um, Solar Witt and Michael Fried and Robert Morris. On the other hand, we have to understand that the importance of sculpture as this bounded critical category was beginning to wane in correlation with a burgeoning rejection of medium as an organizing critical force. And in Europe and the Americas, the 60s were marked by the rapid advancement of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary practices and a kind of feverish quest for new media. And by the close of the decade, the definition of sculpture had become so elastic that in the introduction to the 1972 book, The New Avant-Garde Issues for Art of the 70s, it claims of sculpture, and quote, the term itself has no precise meaning. It merely covers the no man's land between painting and architecture. So 
So Naaman forged his professional identity in the crucible of this period. And this is the context in which I want to um, suggest we must position his interests in Henry Moore. Although Naaman is famous for a really eclectic approach to media, so he made work that was videos, films, books, sound, holograms, installation, performance, um, simultaneously it's really the sculptural that proved to be the defining force in his practice. Um, in the landmark 2007 essay, Nauman's Body of Sculpture, and Wagner argues persuasively that Nauman's work of the 60s was engaged in a dismantling of a system of sculptural representation, which was this kind of dialectical interrogation that paradoxically put sculpture right at the heart of his practice. Um, and my own sculptural <coughs> thesis uses Nauman as a case study for thinking about how sculptural concerns could be traced in his work beyond sculpture's traditional categorial limits. So now didn't invoke more in the late 1960s simply for the purposes of mocking him, as Kramer suggests, um, but as part of the struggle to negotiate a legacy of modern sculpture at a time when the field of sculptural practice was really expanding to the point of dissolution. In Naaman's practice, Moore was a proxy for a tradition of sculpture as a, bounded, as a bounded medium which was under duress in the 1960s. Yet titles such as Light Trap for Henry Moore and Seated Storage Capsule for Henry Moore indicate Naaman was interested in whether it might be possible to kind of trap or store this tradition, while his work simultaneously took the notion of what might constitute sculptural practice to new limits. The suggestion now one wanted to retain an investment in Moore's brand of modern sculpture is supported by comments that he's made in an interview given in 1972, in which he cautions contemporaries such as Anthony Caro and William Tucker against jettisoning Moore's legacy. So these are now one's words. Some of them sort of badmouthed Henry Moore, that the way Moore made work was old fashioned and oppressive, and all the people were really held down by his importance. So he was being put down, shoved aside, and the idea I had at the time was while it was probably true to a certain extent, they should really hang on to him more, because they might need him again sometime. So in this excerpt we've got now and then he's describing the figure of Moore as looming as a large and oppressive and um, retrograde force in the sculptural imagination of the sixties. Um, as many of you already know, by the late 1960s, Moore's international reputation had been sealed by a series of very high-profile um, public uh, commissions in the preceding decade, uh, including sculptures outside UNESCO's Paris headquarters and the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts in New York. Yet by the late 1960s, certain younger English sculptors rejected what they perceived as Moore's stale monumentalism and the outmoded humanist values often associated with his work. While admitting that Moore's dominance in the field of sculpture proved to be an obstacle to emerging sculptural practice, Nama maintains Moore signifies sculptural values that are worth hanging on to in this decade when exciting emerging modes of practice were bursting the banks of the critical framework bounded by medium. Returning then to Light Trap for Henry Moore number one and its counterpart Light Trap for Henry Moore number two, which was made the same year. I suggest these photographs represent crucial precedents for the exploration of virtual sculptural bodies that Nauman will pursue in his subsequent hologram series. With the help of his friend Jack Fulton, Nauman made the images by photographing the path of a torch, tracing the form in front of an animal stills camera on a long exposure. I think in these works, Moore's reference not only through the title but also through the formal drawing sorry, but also through formal technique. In his 2011 essay, Robert Slifkin noted how Nam's photographs recall the well-known photographs of Pablo Picasso, which were published in Life magazine in 1949 and taken by the photographer Jean Millet. However, Millet's famous image of Picasso were only part of a series that featured other artists and musicians, um, which included more. 
Here we see Morton in 1949, alongside what appears to be a full-size plaster of the sculpture family group, in which he's producing a luminous three-dimensional drawing of a form reminiscent of one of his reclining figures. The inclusion of the large scale and weighty sculpture alongside the levitating ephemeral body almost seems to anticipate the trajectory of sculpture at the end of the 1960s, famously chronicled by Lucy Lippard in terms of its so-called dematerialization. If the light trap for Henry Moore photographs look back to the modern sculpture of Moore, who is, who is invoked in both their titles and their technique, they also reach forward towards a future for sculpture, the sculptural in new media. Um, in light trap, the light trap Henry Moore photographs premiere a set of concerns that now we will pursue in his pioneering series of holographic self-portraits. So despite what popular culture would have you believe, um, a hologram is, well, an optical hologram is a virtual three-dimensional image which is made by recurring interference patterns and waves of light. Um, I don't have time to go through how this works today, but then we must talk about it more we can later. Um, the first successful optical holograms were produced in 1963, and by 1967, Nan had become one of the first artists to work um, with the emerging te technology as a creative medium. Nan's eager embrace of new creative tools of the decades echoes Moore's own approach to new technologies, which is this exhibition shows. Um, included incorporating newly developed tools such as um, polystyrene and felt-tip pens. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you all about holograms, how holograms are made today, but what I will tell you is what it's like to view a hologram. So in order to look at one, you look through a small plate which is usually made of glass um, and held up on a stand and it's illuminated by a laser. And on the far side of the glass, this is for a particular type of hologram called a transmission hologram, um, and that's the type now I made. You see this kind of floating, luminous apparition. So now we made two series of holographic self portraits. First hologram series, Making Faces, and this comprised 11 individual holograms portraying his face and neck being manipulated by his hands. And second hologram series, Full Figure Poses, which comprises 10 holograms now his whole body in these quite strange and buckled contortions. These are the only holograms he's made in his career to date, and they've long been considered something of an anomaly in his practice. But there's been some recent exhibitions, um, a new scholarship by myself and an art historian called Taylor Walsh, um, that are bringing attention to this overlooked area of Nam's practice. So <coughs> formal concerns uh, recur in the holograms that premiere in the light traps for Henry Moore photographs. On wheel demand sized photographic prints depicting figurative forms, anticipate the hologram's life size scales. This is a medium that records on one to one scale. The anthropomorphic spirals floating in the dark are harbingers of the hologram's levitating figures that can only be viewed in darkened galleries. The ephemeral flashes of light depicted in the photographs are only legible as figurative forms when trapped in the visual system, um, sorry, when trapped in the jaws of the camera's system of visual representation. Similarly, it is only when peering through the technological eye of the holographic plate that Nan's virtual body appears. So to close, I want to suggest that by charting a lineage that links Nan's holograms to these earlier photographs from Light Trap Henry Moore. I've revealed how the holograms need to be recognized through a sculptural lens. And now I hope to hang on to the values of modern sculpture emblemized in his practice by Moore, while simultaneously advancing his interrogation of sculpture into new areas beyond the medium's historical categorial bounds. The photographs enable us to trace Moore's enduring influence, even in high-tech virtual artworks, that couldn't seem further from the weighty monumental sculptures for which he was known. Even as the sculptural moved beyond tangible forms and into the new media of the 1960s, Moore remained a significant force in the sculptural imagination of the decade. Nowland's light track for Henry Moore photographs show how negotiating the influence of Moore was integral to the development of new modes of sculptural practice at a moment when sculpture was being radically rethought in relation to the new media of the 1960s.
this. Yeah. Again, really um, fascinating paper. Um, looking forward to this panel discussion. But before then, our final speaker uh, this morning uh, is Ryan Bishop, uh, Professor of Global Art and Politics at Winchester School of Art, uh, University of Southampton. Ryan's research interests, as I've got to know him a little over the uh, last month or so, are certainly varied and wide ranging. Um, and as listed in your programme notes, he is, of course, the lead editor of the journal Cultural Politics and two books on that subject. Um, but his very, most recent uh, book, Technocrats of the Imagination, Art, Technology, and the Military Industrial Avant-Garde, reveals perhaps Ryan's um, long-standing interest in the histories, uh, genealogies, and archaeologies of military technologies that alter time and space as used by artists, composers, and writers. So I'm feeling like time and space is a, really a theme for this morning. Um, today, I'm going to bring uh, this research fair on Henry Moore in a paper titled When a White Flash Sparked Microtemporalities, Military Technology and Ballistic Aesthetics in Henry Moore's Atticus. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Well, I will start with the requisite uh, thanking of Hannah and Tom for organizing all of this, as well as the requisite caveat that I'm not a Henry Moore scholar. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to start with two snippets of poetry at the outset. One is from W.H. Arden, The Age of Anxiety, a poet uh, who, whom Henry Moore admired. And it goes like this. Do I love this world so well that I have to know how it ends? The second snippet of poetry is from the American poet Galway Cannell. That's from a poem of his called The Fundamental Project of Technology. And it's about a visit to the Peace Museum in Hiroshima. He says, under glass, glass dishes which change in color, a house of iron. Bundles of wire become solid, lumps of iron. A pair of pliers, a ring of skull bone fused to the inside of the helmet. A pair of eyeglasses taken off the eyes of an eyewitness without glass, which vanish when a white flash sparks. Now, my interest today, I, I'm very interested in the Cold War. I do a lot of work on the relationship between military technology and the modes of uh, artistic and aesthetic production. And as Hannah said, uh, a lot of it, how this ties to time and space. And of course, we're not going to be able to escape time and space because we, ha we are not masters of metaphysics. So we will, we will always be grappling with these concerns. So my focus today is on the arrival at a moment of two visions of vision, or two versions of visuality and visualization that find form in a specific piece by more. In a sense, almost all military technological development since the middle part of the 19th century to the present is essentially aesthetic, in that it is an attempt to prosthetically extend and modify human perception in order to accelerate judgment and inform action, and that uh, to accelerate judgment is the aesthetic part, because that's the difference between aesthesis and aesthetics. In other more common and connotative meanings of aesthetics, though, military technology during the same time period has informed traditional aesthetic modes of cultural production in the arts, popular and high, conservative and avant-garde, traditional and experimental. Rather than looking at the military and its operations as the content of, of artistic and aesthetic exploration, this talk briefly examines military technology as the conditions of possibility and means of production for artistic works and experiments. These means are simultaneously material, technological, and imaginary, or noetic, with the goal of understanding the works and their media formations both a product of an aesthetic condition and constitutive of that condition. Particularly, we will consider those technologies that produce micro-temporalities, that is, infinitely short snippets of temporal phenomena made into storable, reproducible spatial forms that find their way into artistic production. Now, this is a digital technique that dates back to antiquity. The micro-temporalities I will consider here are in dialogue with what I have called ballistic aesthetics, that is, the perception and judgment predicated on materiality and operability of technologies of propulsion. Ballistic aesthetics and microtemporalities operate in the three works in this talk. 
a sound piece by the artist Leif Inga, along with the photographic work of Harold Edgerton, through which I will explore elements at play in Moore's Adam piece. To place it within a context of works that examine the technological conditions of their production through an aesthetic manipulation of time and space. Such artistic work exploits military technologies that operate in the spectrums of sensation that reside beyond human unaided apprehension and help render them apparent again. Okay? All right. So the next section is called Micro Temporalities in Remote Sensing, the Frequency of the Cold War. The capacity to, to discern the difference between an underground nuclear explosion and natural geological occurrences, such as earthquakes, resides in an aesthetic judgment of a particular strike built into the software of remote sensors. Or rather, it entails transferring that discernment to a frequency or a sine wave. How to accomplish this feat resulted in the resuscitation of a centuries-old mathematical formula sped up for fast calculations through military technological demands to slow time. It has become perhaps the most ubiquitous algorithm going today, sometimes described as an algorithm for the whole family. Used in audio signal processing, all forms of scientific imaging, data visualization, pattern recognition, and electronic music, amongst other areas. Known as the fast Fourier transform, this hyperactively applied algorithm has its contemporary provenance in telecoms, military geology, and sound synthesis research instigated by the Pentagon and Bell Labs. James Elkins notes that this algorithm is as ubiquitous in contemporary scientific image analysis as the notion of West, as the notion perspective in Western realism. The formula gained rapid and widespread application when John Tukey tweaked the model during a meeting held by JFK's Scientific Advisory Committee in order to ratify a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviets. Means of detecting atomic tests remotely through seismological time series was needed. And it could be accessed by various offshore detectors offered at the time. However, the computing power and time required for such analysis precluded the solution until Tsuki reduced the, the discrete Fourier transform into its faster version, the FFT. To develop specifically a system for the remote detection of nuclear explosions underground, ARPA, the R&D branch of the US military, needed to build acoustic signatures for earthquakes and explosions to distinguish between the two and to verify events in Siberia, a site of both underground nuclear testing and much tectonic movement. And thus, the Soviets could orally camouflage nuclear tests or claim misinterpretations of these as being actually natural phenomena and not military technological ones. The spectrum analysis afforded by FFT calculations result in microtemporal units of remotely accessed sound. These microtemporal units become the building blocks in Leif Inga's 2008 digital sound piece, Nine Beat Stretch. The work situated at the intersection of avant-garde found object, sound installation for a gallery, and a parody of a classical musical canon. Inga's instructions for realizing the piece read like a flux's conceptual operation placed into a digital future. He asks for the exhibition space to take a CD recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, any version will do, and use granular synthesis software to stretch the works to 24 hours in length while maintaining pitch throughout. This is possible due to the affordances of granular synthesis software on the FFT, which allow one to slice and then splice milliseconds of sound that preserve not only pitch, but timbre. In fact, potentially infinite replication of each slice is possible and indeed necessary because no specific work recording is listed in the artwork's instructions. This potentially infinite replication of an infinite slice therefore becomes the base material to be decelerated and elongated to a 24-hour duration. The time dilation of the FFT after migrating from, uh, became, 
became a source of artistic and acoustic research at Bell Labs in the 1960s, before it began to move from military remote sensing surveillance and nuclear tests and becoming the fundamental material for India's artwork with the temporal flow of the music stored and reproduced in microtemporal units. The once top secret process is now standard issue in off the shelf audio software when you buy any computer from the Pink Cafe Bar. Okay, so now to the heart of the matter the two versions of visualization, atomic light. The basic technique of Inga's conceptual sound pro sonic project resides in the same digital thought processes that were applied to analog equipment operative in the 19th century chrono photography of Edward Murray. Edward Mybridge and Jean Etienne Jules Moret, that in the and that in the mid 20th century by Harold Edgerton, which we turn to now. MIT engineer Harold Edgerton's experimentation with lightning photograph techniques from the 1930s, as well as flash systems for reconnaissance aerial photography conducted, conducted at night during World War II, helped him achieve public fame in the early 1950s with his stroboscopic photographs made at MIT. These images exemplify a literal ballistic aesthetics of shooting apples and playing cards with bullets. But you see an example up here, uh, which was called by some of the wags, how to make applesauce at MIT. <laughs> During the 1940s and 50s, he is hired by the Department of Energy to photograph nuclear uh, bomb tests. The department wanted to photograph these nuclear explosions in time-lapse manner such that they could examine how a nuclear explosion evolves over hundreds of thousands of a second. As with Meyer Bridges, galloping horses, and Edgerton's bullets passing through objects, in order to make very high-speed movement visible, one must slow it down. And Edgerton did this at startling speeds with analog technologies and digital atomistic techniques. A further step in his experiments constitutes an intensified technological feedback loop, because the military re realizes that Edgerton's camera shutters are actually more accurate than the triggers being used in the nuclear weapons. These mechanisms become not only effective for documenting the bomb's explosion, but also for igniting one. Quite literally, then, the shutters migrate from the cameras and become triggers for nuclear detonations. The resultant images capture the physical effects that they trigger, cause and effect in one visual technological mechanism called the rapidronic shutter, which use filters and magnets to slice time into micro units. There is actually one more step in this technological feedback loop. Uh, Edgerton sets up a military industrial um, company called EEG. They produce visualizing satellites, and they are now up there being used for covert surveillance in the contemporary world. So the shutters continue to look down on us. In the instance of capturing the development of the nuclear explosion, the magneto-optic shutter refined from earlier experiments allowed time to be sliced to no less than one half of one millionth of a second. Edgerton's archive includes photographs from the Inomataka Toll in the early 1950s, in which the nuclear fireball just emerges. It is sometime between 0, 0.0 seconds and 0. 0.0006 seconds. And in that fraction of a second, before it becomes the iconic mushroom cloud, we glimpse shapes reminiscent of Moore's upper half of Adam Deuce. The microtemporal slices of the initial second after ignition, shaved into milliseconds by the rapidronics techniques, exemplify time critical media that are of time, but more importantly, that manipulate the time axis, which forms and informs our horizon of perception, ethics, and more. That is, the, image show, the images show a micro moment of ballistic aesthetics that reconfigures our collective relationship with and understanding of time, 
visuality and vision itself. Ubiquitous in the popular photo magazines of the 1950s and 60s, such as Picture Post or Time Magazine or Life Magazine, and many others, Edgerton's photos circulated widely and contributed to the visual ecology of popular imaginaries. Edgerton added to this ecology images made through atomic light that rendered invisible events visible. I'm not arguing direct influence of Edgerton's images on more, but pointing to the fact that they are symptoms of the same visual culture and cultural moment and clearly share morphological qualities. Interestingly for me, the upper half of Adam Peace resembles far less the iconic image of the mushroom cloud than it does the initial incarnation of the nuclear explosion is revealed by Edgerton's photos. That is, it resembles the invisible pre-cloud moment of the explosion, not the visible cloud. The two halves of Adam Peace juxtapose a literal, a literal and figurative base resulting from the solidity of our quotidian vision supporting the machine visualization of the once invisible as revealed by Edgerton's repertory shutter. The visualization found in the base, it is worth knowing, was one already influenced by centuries of technological developments and not some pure direct biological vision. The top half, though, provides a new technological vision. The sculpture then embodies two versions of visualization, two regimes of visual techniques. Operating as the visualization of a Cold War technology of visualization, the upper half of that piece connects also to the FFT and its micro-slicing of temporal processes. The chronopoetics of art in Inga, Edgerton, and more remind us that all works of art are time-based art. Through the combination of techniques of visualization that play across artistic and military aesthetics in Edgerton's images, more sculpture and a nuclear explosion reveal the simul simultaneous tempor temporal scales found in the microsecond and the deep time, the geological time, of nuclear isotopes. Adam Peace acts as a vector between the microtemporality produced in Edgerton's images and the macrotemporality of nuclear half-life rendered in structural form. It portrays a new means of visualizing props precariously on the earlier, more archaic mode of scene in anticipation of the next articulation of the visual reconfigured by techniques if species survival allows. Now, my coda. Um, figure in ground, figure in ground. The most famous media image of a body from Hiroshima is one of no body. The white shadow of a person vaporized by the explosion and permanently embossed in a stone bridge. A zero body whose entire somatic substance is now forever fused with stone. This is another kind of atomic light, resulting in a ballistic aesthetic image, one taken by the weapon itself. The photogram, not the photograph, but the photogram, the bomb made is exposed in the stone into which the bodies merge making the earth and built environment a photographic surface and converting the city's entire organic and inorganic material into a photograph. In a letter to the historian William McNeil, who's integral to the University of Chicago Commission of Adam Peace, Moore writes in 1967 that the idea of the piece pertains to his sculpture series, Hammerheads, and to his, quote, interior slash exterior form. The, I have access to that letter courtesy of Tom and the uh, more archive, so I'm not there. The interior exterior form in Adam Peace, juxtaposed with the Helmet Head series, results in a, in a set of metonymic resemblances at scale. The skull inside helmets becomes the skull in the emergent mushroom cloud, a, ser a series which replaces the helmet with the mushroom cloud. We have before us various forms of metonymic relations between endosomatic and exosomatic layerings with an emphasis on protection, defense, and its necessary structural reinscription of vulnerability. From the helmet to the shield, from the shelter to the bomb, to the exosomatic satellite room of the planet. 
These offer a long array of human history as an escalation of precarity and fragility, of defensive weapons using ever more offensive weapons, followed by ever more sophisticated offensive technologies that in turn, etc., and a Heideggerian escalation of technicity, in which technology gains momentum of its own, and the only solution to, te to, to technological problems is more technology. Moore's almost hyperbolic insistence on the body in so much of his work, especially the later large-scale reclining figures, counters the atomic shadows emergence from the endless futility found in the cycle of, defense, of defensive techniques <coughs> that, always run, that only render us more vulnerable. In each instance, the technological tra trajectory of cause and effect in shattered bodies or a ring of skull bone fused to the inside of the helmet. Ever more efficient means to turn us into useless lumps of soot and bristle or be dematerialized altogether in a white, spot, in a white flash of sparks, resulting in Hiroshima shadows and large scale assertions of somatic vulnerability and plasticity, dotting landscapes and public squares, reminding us that all bombing is suicide bombing. Thank you. I shall try and boil uh, a little bit of my thinking. Um, of course, I think uh, time is something that we keep uh, returning to again and again. And it's interesting how time and technology and materiality seem to be, um, you know, themes that run through all three papers. And how um, from Bruce Nauman's sort of um, this idea of a storage capsule, this idea of perpetuity of um, sort of somehow uh, kind of arresting time, both in, uh, in, in his work and with those holograms and with the, um, the light trap, that sense of trapping, um, clearly maps across to, to what you were saying, Ryan, about this idea of, of, of visualizing these microseconds in time, these, um, the sense that Moore's work then takes that microsecond and combines it with this sort of deep time. It's, it's, a way that I had never thought about um, atom piece actually um, in, in, in that kind of time-based way. And interesting that you also end with this um, image of the shadow of a figure, um, which made me think straight back to uh, your paper, Jonathan, um, and this idea of the humanity and of the, the, the figuring of, uh, of humanism in a, uh, an era of technological change that seems to want to kind of take us away from that. And interesting that the uh, works that now we chose to kind of trap were all actually figurative, albeit in this kind of abstracted sense. Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to formulate out of this a question. Well, I'm just going to just jump off what you just yeah. said, Hannah, and raise really with Elizabeth. I thought one of the really compelling things with the now that light draws yeah. was how they resonate with that minimalist, post-minimalist concern for human scale and the way that bodies mm -hmm. occupy and move through space. I thought instantly of the setting of the, the cast of the space under my chair and Robert Morris in his box. I could always be able to um, what it's called. But um, do you think that's basically part of what's going on there is seeing in more a sense of a sort of submerged sense of the way real bodies are, are in the world. Um, yeah, 
but I think in Newman there's this weird relationship where the body and sculpture are like these two terms that are, he moves between really fluidly. And so there is always this kind of getting rid of the body, which it often expresses quite violently, um, which really made me think of what you were talking about, Ryan, with this kind of uh, violence of the era and yes. the body's uh, being under attack. But one of the things, just to go back to what Hannah was saying, that I think kind of really links the papers is this uh, anxiety about time more broadly, not only in terms of thinking about different modes of temporality of seeing, but particularly in the discourse of sculpture, you get um, uh, out an object code and Michael Fries, very famous text, where the anxiety is about what happens when we admit to sculpture as being this very temporal experience, and then where does that go? And then that leads to this place where it is perhaps it no longer becomes sculpture and it leads down all these other avenues. So I was quite interested in the way that um, your paper really spoke to what's one of the key issues actually in the discourse of sculpture at that time yeah. through these other technologies. And it's a fascinating story. Yeah, um, I, I think that in, in many different ways, the relationship between the kinds of temporalities that Mill is beginning to explore is offered has always been there with art. I mean, the question that Hannah and I were talking about once was, how long is the sculpture? You know, <laughs> what is the temporal duration of the sculpture? And it, and same, you can ask that of a painting as well. What, how long is a painting? And so that's why I was kind of working around this insistence on all art is time-based art because you can't take it out of all. You can't take it out of time. You do not have that metaphysical placement outside of that. So, yeah, and, and just trying to remove the kind, the sense that the monumentality of sculpture needn't be reducible to its being impervious to, to time because it is of time, through time, and operates, as you said, in ways where people vandalize it, melt it down. Mm -hmm. It's still the sculpture. <laughs> it's still the, it's still its component parts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you talked, uh, John, it's all about kind of sculpture being contingent, which of course, yeah. you know, is also sort of sets it in its time. You know, there is a kind of, you know, it's entirely um, embedded in, in, in its moment of production. However, you know, we want to kind of think about these ideas of Moore's um, works in particular, often described in, in terms of being empty vessels, so they sort of be filled by a variety of ideological kind of content. You know, I think that that's kind of maybe worth kind of puncturing that kind of notion of action. And, and Moore in the 60s is, is very much a, a product of that the changes that you articulated in the opening to, to the, um, the panel, and that is real, the, the emergence and overarching control, especially through Cold War technology, of real-time teletechnology, because th that collapses time into space. Over there, it becomes right now, which is why we have somebody joining us on Zoom from, mm -hmm. from the US, right? So that it becomes this, this sense of using space to create time-based phenomena and time-based phenomena to create spatial. Mm -hmm. Jenny, you had a, a question. <laughs> As the conversation moved on further away. <laughs> <laughs> you can go back. <laughs> yeah. um, it was a, oh, yes. hi, thank you so much for your papers. Absolutely fascinating and really love the way in which you all framed them. So, um, my question, which I was also trying to formulate there, it's not really going to tie everything together in such a wonderful way, but it was to you, Elizabeth, and I, I just wanted to ask um, about the light trap photographs and ask about their scale again. Is it, am I right that they were quite large? Yeah, they're like human size. They are human size. So I was really fascinated at, that, you, that that was the case and I just didn't, I didn't know that. And then what you were saying about um, Nauman's use of the hologram also being of human scale. So this kind of made me think about um, scale again in this period and then brought me sort of back to your paper, John, in the sense of, you know, um, I suppose kind of to what extent 
um, was scale in this in the sixties period still important? And I suppose why why did Nauman choose to work, you know, at a human scale? Was this something to do with, you know, some sort of search for humanism in some way? Um, yeah, sorry, that's not particularly well formulated, but <laughs> scale in the sixties and humanism. <laughs> I guess I, I would just highlight, maybe you can say something else with this, but, but um, the famous letter that's published it in the Times about Moore is all about scaling up, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about him taking his designs and because he's um, producing monumental works out of them, he's scaling them up to the point at which for these younger sculptors they don't work anymore because conception doesn't match for realisation, right? So it's one of the fundamental terms in which Moore is um, challenged um, but I think, as as far as the new generation are concerned, I I, I do think, and, and I don't address it directly in the paper, but it comes through in our end. Phenomenology is something that becomes um, deeply important in that period, partly because Malo Ponti is um, mm -hmm. translated for the first time at Northwestern in the early sixties, and I'm certainly. Sure Yes, absolutely. And, and certainly these um, young, very well-educated, um, well-read sculptors are, are very conversant in phenomenology. And I think so th the way in which they talk about scale is, in a, in a way, an attempt to reassert a human relationship with sculpture uh, in, in their framing, a subject-object mm -hmm. relationship. And you see that in something, I think, like Caro's table pieces, the, the, what Heidegger would call the to handness of them, the way that they sort of um, are both like and unlike objects that we use but don't notice. Um, so, yeah, I think that's. I think like, what I'd add to that is at the same time as this kind of intellectual assertion of a human body. Um, it's also a time where these kind of technologies that you're talking about, right? Produce this profound anxiety about storage and informational storage. Um, and storage is always such a big thing when you're thinking about sculpture, I'm sure everyone here knows. Um, and yeah, so I think there's something weird going on in the holograms that's to do with uh, the potential idea of the storage of the body and what that means for the body to be entering this different um, relation to technology around this time, like there's a lot of anxiety about that. So there is at the same time that there's an assertion of the body, there's also yeah. a kind of anxiety Absolutely. about technology in relation to the body. I, I would also just kind of um, further that by thinking about the absence of the body in the normal works actually, mm -hmm. because they're sort of almost sarcophagus-like in their kind of, they're encircling um, a body that is not actually there. Um, and that is pretty much what the image does at the end of your paper, Ryan, but also this absence of the body that you were talking about, John, in, in kind of the implication of the human in relation to the object, um, rather than the actual picture or figuring of the human itself. And, and for more, kind of, um, you know, the moving into a sort of more organic kind of representation of the body. So body as landscape, as opposed to body as body, and, and of course, in terms of scale, scale being this huge um, area where I think, although it came um, under uh, some criticism for the sort of what was sometimes termed uh, an overinflation of Moore's um, sculpture and a monumentalization, it, it actually was very daring, very innovative uh, in, a, in a way of announcement and public, the public nature of um, the works and the way that the human would be forced to navigate um, these monument works. So, yeah, I mean, I think Moore clearly says that he didn't find the, the human, the figure, um, the most appropriate for the greatest enlargement and that actually the human figure was something that he felt you couldn't really enlarge beyond about one and a half times life size. Yeah. So that, you know, when he wanted to make something larger than that, he almost always went for these organic, natural forms. Even though they could be figurative, they were more like um, landscape figures. I think elements of this issue around scales too has to do with that anxiety around the body and has to do with the belatedness that you were addressing. Because there is 
always a belief in this. <laughs> we are always out of sync with history, as Nietzsche you know, said. We're always out of joint. Um, and with the scales, one of the things that emer one of the things that emerges with the reconsideration of humanism in the 1960s is simultaneously the Vietnam War, which mm -hmm. figures in all of these things. I mean, with, with the Nauman, I was really reminded of the Yoko Ono piece where she wraps the musicians in bandages, mm -hmm. and you know, it's just this whole. And, and then there's the bound soldier, right, in, in the Nauman. Um, but there, there is this sense of what happened to the human post World War II. Especially, I mean, if you think about Arendt and Marcuse and their influence out of Heidegger and Heidegger's association with the Nazis, all of that was part and parcel of the discussions that were offered at the time and trying to think about what is the relationship between art and technology and what is the, um, what is the role of institutions that perpetuate these and their placement within Vietnam, within the Vietnam War. And this was a war due to real-time technologies that was brought live into our homes and on TV. And yet simultaneously, as I think you, you would have explored at length in your own work, there's a utopian strain to that Absolutely. world, and there's the transhumanist strain there's, that's like, there's the still all watched over by machines of love and grace, as yes. the yes. British poet Richard brought together. So, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, which also Adam Curtis used, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and that's um, very much bound up with, with the body and this thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact is that, again, time and space, we can't escape, neither can we escape the relationship between the body and technology, because the human as human is, is bound up with our capacity to store memory and experience and things that are exosomatic to us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which finds its way initially in the digital form with letters and numbers. In, in terms of writing and storage and those sorts of things. Which is also why those become the basis of the earliest uh, mainframe experimental uh, works of art. Mm -hmm. Things having to do with numbers and letters. So I think this, uh, like you mentioned, Marcuse in relation to the, the um, student movement of the time yeah. and I think even in his work, you get this metaphor of the one-dimensional, yes. as opposed to you know the sculptural. So yes. there is all this anxiety the about the, the flattening of the subject and yes. what it means to be a contemporary subject that loses its three-dimensionality. And and some of that loss occurs through the capacity to access scales. Mm -hmm. We're no longer the measure of all things, humans. We are the measure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just become the measure. Yeah. We can just leave it there. It is interesting that I think, you know, especially in the context of an organisation where we talk about sculpture a lot, and this is a conference about sculpture, that all of you have um, basically referred to photographic um, processes and to, to photography being a really essential kind of um, medium at this moment. And, um, I, you know, I was, I was picking up a lot of uh, terms around replication, reproducibility, and that also having this effect across Time, you know, you could, there's a multiplicity of moments there, which is not just about capturing and visualizing a moment in time, but then being able to disseminate that moment yes. across multiple geographies as well. Um, and, and that possibly then sort of dehumanizing it even further, actually. And um, like maybe being one of the uh, like large criticisms of the mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. it is the amount of work, the reproducibility of the work okay. and the amount of work. That even though he was obviously totally committed to the hand made, mm -hmm. um, that the that because you were able to make because sculpture is this technology of reproduction a lot mm -hmm. of the time, that you were able to make so many that this becomes like one of the main uh, I think problems for his reputation in that decade is this tension between yeah. the individual and reproducibility. Of yeah, and, and and the notion of uh, the universal, which you touched on, John, in the sense that the same form can mean you know the same or different things, but can be sort of um, placed in different contexts and um, be equally suitable, but possibly for very different um, uh, reasons and, and, and ends. I mean, would, it's interesting also just to, to pick up on that that atom piece, of course, is 
becomes nuclear energy yeah. and, Chicago, and is a unique bronze cast. The work that actually perhaps most kind of um, captures time is the one that isn't uh, reproduced um, anywhere else, albeit there are you know, parts of the working model that are used for the um, UK. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, we we're having so a nice conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, are there any uh, other questions from the uh, audience? Yes, Chris. Thank you very much. I find this fascinating uh, um, presentation. I want to kind of just focus in on one thing that Liz said, which is the, the, the quote from Bruce Lowry that, that you really need to hang on to him anymore because you might need him sometime. And I was wondering whether you, because you obviously you, you know a huge amount about Nauman, much more than I do, what, what he really meant by that. Was it just um, an attempt to say, look, this isn't just mocking, uh, as he'd been accused of? Was it that, that the key thing he wanted to hang on to was the human body, which appears in all those, in those pieces about him? Is it broader that, that he sees art becoming too abstract? Is it a comment on, on the consumerism that's coming in through pop art and, and the Italian American? And British artists like Al Alloway that we were talking about. Did, which aspects of Henry Moore and why do you think Nanon's referring to? I think he was referring to uh, sculpture specifically and to wanting to hold on to that legacy of sculpture and these things that Jonathan brought up really beautifully to do with. Uh, uh, situatedness and being a body and being in a place in a moment where um, you've got the mm, uh, video, so the quarter pack comes out, I think in like 67 or something, and so artists were able to make video work. The, the relationship between the body and technology and the reproducibility of the body in technology and recorded information, stored information live experience that all these things are being uh, coming into a collision in the 60s and so I think what he's saying is in this moment where um, we are uh, being subject to these different types of re reproducibility and uh, like the, the technologies are able to store and hold on to and bring stuff back how do we hold on to something that is to do with the body and is to do with a kind of liveness and a, in the manness? And I think he puts that into uh, sculpture. Sculpture is this cipher for these concerns. And so he allows himself to move forwards into this new time. He works extensively with film, he works extensively with video. Um, and these new weirdo technologies, uh, things to do with like um, uh, stereoscopic glasses yeah. he's made recently and holograms. So he really goes with that, but I think the thing he's trying to hold on to is this connection back to something that is a little bit more um, uh, degraded at that time to do with these values, not necessarily of like humanism, but perhaps to do with being, yeah, like a person, mm -hmm. like to get back to that. So that's what I think he's interested in hanging on to. And part of the, the anxiety around the storage uh, issue and reproducibility issue is the commodification of the all things, mm -hmm. uh, which you alluded to. Yeah. Um, yeah. James. <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, um, I've been thinking about that now and quotes a lot, and it's really striking how they talk about more. Um, and now it refers to more being kind of put down and shoved aside, kind of as if he was an object. And so I kind of that really comes across to me that idea of you know more is kind of an avatar for figurative sculpture. And yeah. um, as, as you were saying, Jonathan, kind of this idea about kind of sculpture in the sixties giving up on the human body to kind of find a new kind of relation to insert itself into you know relevance to contemporary life. Um, and I was also thinking about. Um, those sculptures um, now and works are around the same time as the question around the, the donation of a, a large gift to the Tate and the letter which Carl mm -hmm. and so many other sculptors, sculptors sign and a, a large part of that is kind of about storage space and it's about kind of resource and it's not mm -hmm. so much about the quality of Moore's 
uh, work, but this question of you know what are we going to do with it? You know, there's, there's so there's so much of it, and so it it does all feed into that, right? Mm. So you have a comment and a question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice point actually with it's absolutely ties in with uh, him in the, in the exhibition. Um, but it also, like, just to sort of counter the solidity of that, you know, requirement for storage, there's a there's a, something really nice that you said, um, John, which I think was a, a Berger quote about yeah. the work striving to be an yeah. image. Yeah. And I love this idea of this sort of apparition element where there's sort of some, yeah. they're hovering between this sort of sense of. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're clearly solid, and yeah. yet um, the image of them is in doubt somehow. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that's as much as anything. That's just Berger wanting these works to not be archetypes. He wants them to be anchored in a in, mm. in, in a, the moment of their production, the time of their making. That's his his um, mm. his something socialist modern thinking about time about the, what the the tiredness and. Um, of late modernism, um, but I think I mean I, I sort of took that Berger quote and drew it through to sort of dramatise the thing through like, the relationship between object and image. One thing that's come out of this conversation, I think, is that so much of how we talk about sculpture in this in this late modernist moment mm -hmm. is completely dominated by Michael Fried and his set of critical terms. We all we all sort of disagree and see it as restrictive, but it, he he's still allowed to set the terms mm -hmm. and that transition from um, you know that that free moment of anxiety to minimalism, post minimalism performance. It's so heavily codified, and I think I just sort of flag that one of the things that really close and careful study of sculpture from this period, including Moore's, can can highlight is a much more ambivalent relationship to to objecthood and to the world that, um, and a culture of doubt and anxiety that sort of go through top to bottom and can affect anyone. I, I think it's interesting too that the, this concern around the body in the 1960s in sculpture that that's anchored in our conversation today completely leads the role of the body in sculpture from the Soviet bloc. Mm -hmm. And that there was no concern about the body there, and there was there was an exp and that's kind of where Berger's sensibility yes. coming from, right? Is is a, is a recouping of and, and a desire to bring to bear that kind of actual materiality of the body, of the physicality, of labor that is increasingly being dematerialized in, in the information age. Um, I'm noticing the time, and I'm, I think you know if there's another oh, question, yeah. we can um, could certainly squeeze it in. But otherwise, um, I would, I'm sure we can continue these conversations over lunch and uh, throughout right. the rest of the day. But uh, please join me in thanking all our speakers this morning. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming back. Uh, it was such a great morning, and um, thank you to all of our speakers. I am going to very tentatively declare myself a Henry Moore scholar because we were declaring earlier. So, <laughs> but I will caveat that with um, really my sort of period of focus on Moore has been from the twenties to the end of the nineteen fifties. So, like Godfrey, I was very much looking forward to this conference and to the exhibition actually because I've always found the nineteen sixties a bit of a tricky period to deal with in terms of war, and I think some of that really does have to do with that sense of the idea of this kind of hanging on to more and simultaneously wishing to discard him or leave him behind um, both in terms of sort of materiality and um, ideologically. And um, I really enjoyed the exhibition, Hannah and all colleagues at the foundation. Uh, I think that the very clever chronology that runs underneath us was um, a great reminder of many things about this decade. And one of the things that struck me was actually that it, it sort of represented the death of the um, kind of old guard of art criticism. And I was reminded by the chronology only that Herbert Reed passed away in 1968. And of course, some of that 
kind of um, hanging on was perpetuated by Reed himself. And I know that James is going to talk much more eloquently about um, Moore and his critical reception to us in a minute. Um, I think that chronology also reminds us very well of what an intense period of rapid change the 60s were um, challenging and some, in some senses to the solution. And some aspects of uh, colonial rules, space travel, new technology, civil unrest, new media, and especially broadcast interest in more, which I know one of our papers this afternoon is also going to pick up on. And the other thing I just wanted to quickly say was Jonathan's quote this morning, um, which was from the early 1950s, I think, where Moore was talking about being in this transitional age, was I think the same quotes that he used when he started to talking about the need for the artist to become um, more agile. And he was talking about agility in relation to um, especially artistic patronage. And I think that that's something that also persisted in the 60s and maybe even was amplified. So um, we're going to have the same kind of format as before lunch. If everyone can please save their questions until after our three wonderful speakers. And I think one of the really positive elements of the pandemic, if there were any, is that cultural organisations have really embraced the uh, hybrid conference format. So it's brilliant that we have been joined by two wonderful colleagues, um, Alex Taylor and John Curley, who can see, I think, me at the moment, but unfortunately, <laughs> but unfortunately can't see you. So we'll just say to John and Alex that there is a very wonderful and interested audience, large audience here, ready to listen to both of you. And you can tell us whereabouts you're dialing in from, from the US um, later on, perhaps. <laughs> so welcome to you both, and hello. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to introduce our first speaker, which is James Finch, Dr. James Finch, who is currently an assistant curator of 19th century British art at Tate Britain. So I would say his interests span far into the 20th century. And prior to this, James was a curator assistant at the Royal Academy. And um, James's PhD explored the work of the art critic David Sylvester, but he's also an expert on art criticism in the post-war period, and that is what he is going to talk to us about now. So I'll hand over to you, James. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me. It's uh, pretty nice to be here. Um, I'm not actually going to be talking about Herbert Reed today, <laughs> but we can get into that later. Um, so yes, um, my specialism is in the art criticism of the post-1945 period, um, and I'm interested in questions around what constitutes criticism and the, the forms in which criticism is expressed. And today I'm going to talk about the reception of Moore's work during the 1960s, the way his work was regarded and discussed by critics, and how it was seen to relate to the work of younger artists. I'll be focusing in particular on the 1968 exhibition of Moore's work at the Tate Gallery, which I view as a critical act in itself. First slide. Henry Moore in the 1960s was an enormous presence. I'm not referring here to the number of exhibitions of his work, the quantity of public commissions, or his media profile, although these were, of course, contributing factors, but rather to his broader presence in the landscape of modern art in Britain during this period. In any number of essays, particularly about individual sculptors or recent developments in sculpture more generally, more, sometimes alongside Barbara Hepworth, but often not, features as the principal background or foundation to subsequent developments, the pioneer responsible for the current situation. This was accepted as much by his detractors as his supporters. Clement Greenberg, always sceptical about Moore, nonetheless told Edward Lucy Smith in 1968 that if Caro was the Moses of English sculptor, its great leader, Moore was still its Abraham, a father and a generator. And if the novelist Colin McKinney's, writing about the sculptor Tim Scott in 1967, referred to Moore by way of an unflattering contrast with Scott, he still acknowledged that Moore's lonely achievement led the way for successive generations. When Anthony Caro published The Master Sculptor in 1960, he opened by focusing on Moore's celebrity status, quote, 
When you try to think clearly about Henry Moore, you are deafened by the applause. The picture is not man size, but screen size. It is as if the build-up into a great public figure has got out of hand and like a film star's big front has clouded our view of the real Moor. Carver may have been thinking here of Moore's appearance on the cover of Time magazine in late 1959, as well as his appearance in 1960 on the early BBC interview series Face to Face, which also included figures such as Martin Luther King, Bertrand Russell and Carl Jung. This increased visibility of Moore in the media, contributing to the ubiquity of both his sculpture and his thoughts about it. In 1967, Caro was among the numerous prominent artists who signed a letter protesting against the large proposed gift of Moore's work to Tate, not on the basis of quality, but disputing in principle the allocation of such resource to any one artist. The many signatories argued that the resources required to accommodate the gift assigned an heroic and monumental role for the artist, which they rejected in principle. Caro wrote The Master Sculptor in response to the exhibition of Moore's work held at the Whitechapel Gallery in London in November 1960. Under the direction of Brian Robertson, the gallery had established one of the most exciting programmes in Britain. In particular, Robertson had established links with US institutions that brought important first showings of the abstract expressionists to Whitechapel. Beginning with Jackson Pollock in 1958, he held, over the next few years, exhibitions of artists including Mark Rothko, Philip Guston, Helen Frankenthaler, and Franz Klein. This was the context in which the exhibition of Moore's work took place. And in keeping with the Whitechapel Gallery's focus on recent art, the exhibition was of work made by Moore in the previous 10 years. Moore was perhaps best known for earlier work, such as the wartime shelter drawings and the Northampton Madonna which preceded the post-war period during which Moore's reputation truly flourished internationally through career milestones such as his MoMA exhibition of 1946 and the contribution to the 1948 Venice Biennale for which he received the International Sculpture Prize. Almost 10 years after Moore's Tate Gallery exhibition of 1951, the Whitechapel show provided an opportunity for British audiences to see a sustained quantity of Moore's recent work and reassess the artist and his evolution. Caro, who following his 1959 trip to the US, had recently begun making the abstract metal sculpture for which he would become best known, chose this moment to declare that Moore had, quote, grown out of touch with post-war developments in art. Caro's attack was all the more striking, coming from an artist and former assistant to Moore, but the sculptor was not the first to criticise him in this way. John Berger recalled how a negative review in the 1950s led the British Council to telephone Moore to apologise. While Lawrence Salloway, prior to his move to the US in 1961, had by this time written that, quote, Moore is linked with the idea that three-dimensional sculpture must look good from all around, and this has popularly become an absolute requirement of true sculpture. Alloway implied that this hegemony of what he regarded as a mannerist understanding of sculpture was not compatible with appreciation of a sculptor such as Eduardo Pavlozzi, who he described as providing jerky, successive views, each one fairly compact and complete. You are not lured around the corner as you are with Moore. A series of jerky, successive views, compact and complete, which do not lure you around the corner, would also, incidentally, be a fair description of the series of pastiches of Moore's reclining figures which Bruce McLean would make in 1971. <coughs> This presentation was clearly the opposite of Moore's, which several critics considered to be affected by self-conscious grandeur. Brian O'Doherty in 1964 wrote of Moore's work being at odds with what he called anti-rhetorical attitudes in sculpture. And the idea of Moore's sculpture as a form of rhetorical address is a useful one. O'Doherty, reviewing Moore's 1964 Nobler Gallery exhibition in New York, continued by asserting that Moore's use of geological metaphor, quote, seems like a man using the strategies learned in a war that just isn't on anymore. O'Doherty was thinking more in terms of materials, but this idea of Moore's work as emerging from a passive acceptance of nature could also be seen as a gesture of political apathy, as John Berger argued in his 1969 book on the Soviet sculptor Ernst Nivestny, 
in which he contrasted Moore's world of humans overwhelmed by natural forces with what he saw as the heroic conception of the human will in the Vesny. Of course, for every writer detecting a radical shift between Moore and the sculpture of Caro, David Smith, and their followers, there was another noting the continuities. Caro's midday, for instance, was described by William Rubin as possessing a monumentality as much in the spirit of Henry Moore as of David Smith. While in his 1966 survey of British sculpture, Gene Barrow highlighted Isaac Ritkin's Vermont Three Winter as a post caro sculpture indebted to Moore in its renewal of landscape imagery. The idea of Moore as a strand in the tradition of the monolith in 20th century sculpture <coughs> was proposed in a 1970 essay by Patrick McCoffey, which presented Moore as a stage in the monolith, the next of which was represented by Clement Mead Moore. Artists responded particularly strongly to Moore in Germany in particular, as demonstrated by the exhibition of Moore alongside German sculptors in Münster in 2016. While Bruce Nauman's series of works, which Elizabeth has spoken about, responding to Moore, derived from what he felt to be the unfairly malicious criticism of Moore by younger sculptors. As much as Moore and his generation often exaggerated, sorry, as much as Caro and his generation often exaggerated Moore's isolation from contemporary art, perhaps so too did <coughs> Moore. A steady stream of monographs which tended to echo Moore's own reading of his work and the publication of a collection of writings and statements by Moore in 1966 all contributed to what Dorothy Kaczynski has described as, quote, a certain complicity on the artist's part in making his own myth, which tended to isolate him from the evolving dialogue about modern sculpture. Few artists of Moore's generation, much less younger artists, are mentioned in his 1966 book on sculpture, while Moore's 1964 interview with David Sylvester, titled The Michelangelo Vision, about the Rondonini Pietà, is a representative example of the territory in which he felt most comfortable. It is in this context that Sylvester curated the 1968 Moore exhibition at the Tate Gallery, held to coincide with Moore's 70th birthday. Sylvester was by this time well established as a critic and curator. He had curated Moore's previous Tate Gallery exhibition in 1951, but had more of a free hand with this exhibition, in which he credited Moore's generous non-interference in the selection of works. As a result, Sylvester's choice was heavily weighted towards what he felt to be Moore's most creative output. And unlike the Whitechapel exhibition, this heavily favoured the earlier part of Moore's career, with around a quarter of the sculpture and only two of the works on paper having been made in the 60s. Introducing the exhibition, Gabriel White of the Arts Council singled out the fact that the exhibition included by far the most representative collection of Moore's carvings that has been assembled anywhere. Sylvester, while not uncritical of Moore across his career, might be considered as a bridge between the artist and his more antagonistic critics. His association with Moore dated back to his earliest writings in the mid-1940s, which led to a spell working as Moore's secretary in the late 1940s. Sylvester was born in 1924, the same year as Caro and Pawatsi, and so was familiar with the questions around Moore's relevance to younger artists that I have been discussing. Indeed, when Donald Hall wrote asked about this while preparing his 1965 monograph on Moore, Sylvester responded that the reaction against Moore did not start with Anthony Caro, but rather began in the 1940s with Pawatsi, Turnbull, Raymond Mason, and Veg Butler. In summary, Sylvester concluded, all in all, I would say that the atmosphere was more virulently anti-Moore then than it is now. Indeed, Sylvester was close to Turnbull and Pawatsi during this period and shared their enthusiasm for the sculpture of Giacometti, which at that time was understood by many as an anti-Moore position. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quote from Sylvester's letter to, Moore, to um, Donald Hall. To accompany the exhibition, Sylvester wrote a standalone book which he later described as the one thing among the many I've written on Moore in which I got things right. In contrast to many monographs on Moore, this took the form of 13 texts, non-chronological, some very short, 
on different aspects of Moore's work, several of which, such as correspondences, hard and soft, and fitting together, moved away from the familiar categorising of Moore's work by medium or genre to instead consider broader characteristics of his output. Writing in response to this exhibition, the sculptor William Tucker noted that, once again, there was no mention in Sylvester's book to reflect on how Moore's work had influenced, or been influenced by, successive generations of British sculptors. Certainly, he restricted the parallels he drew to the standard reference points cited by Moore himself, and modernist sculptors such as Picasso, Brancusi, and Laurence. In this case, however, the situation is clearly more complicated, as Sylvester was, unlike some of the newspaper critics who dutifully praised the grandeur and heroism of Moore's work, also deeply engaged in these new artistic developments. In the author's no notes at the front of the book, he credited his students at Swarthmore College, Pennsylvania, where he had been teaching while working on the text, who contributed certain interpretations of Moore's imagery. Sylvester was perhaps, above all, closely involved with American sculpture at this time, during which he interviewed and wrote about Robert Rauschenberg, Face Oldenburg, Jim Dean, and others. In 1971, he would curate the Robert Morris exhibition at the Tate Gallery. And in 1968, Sylvester even purchased a felt sculpture by Morris. I say all of this to reinforce the point made by John Wood, David Holtz, and Alex Potts in The Modern Sculpture Reader, in which Sylvester's text, Hard and Soft, was anthologized, that Sylvester's writing here, quote, perhaps parallels this popular interest in soft sculptures and in the dialectic between hard and soft in sculpture. As Tucker complained, the references to precedents and influences in this text are to Michelangelo and Rodin, but Sylvester was clearly thinking transhistorically. In his 1965 interview with Oldenburg, the two men discussed the relationship between the hard and the soft in the sculpture of Benin and Rodin, and even when writing on Robert Morris's felts in 1970, Sylvester mused, quote, it is as if the sculpture were soft in order to enhance awareness of hardness. Sylvester used the term surface elasticity in his interview with Oldenburg, and I wonder whether Joseph Boyce's decision to pay homage to Moore using an elastic band is not related to just this matter of hard and soft. This was Sylvester's approach throughout the book, not to argue in explicit terms for Moore's relevance to younger artists, but to present him in a way that invited such comparisons. The exhibition has been recognised as a valuable elucidation of Moore's more intimate and surrealist influenced output, and positive responses to the exhibition often came from unexpected sources. Guy Barrett, who had co-founded the Signals Gallery years earlier, and was closely identified with developments such as kinetic art, wrote for the Times that, quote, this is really an exhibition to re-experience Moore's work, to unlearn all that's been written about it, and to confront it freshly. Even a brief visit is enough to suggest that most of the theories about him are oversimplifications. Brett mentioned the names of no other artists in his review, but referred on several occasions to the experience of looking at Moore's work. This was also perhaps the most distinctive qualified. This is perhaps also the most distinctive quality of Sylvester's criticism. In his book, he contemplated, for instance. How in looking at the locking piece, quote, one feels one's arm muscles straining as if one were twisting it round to unlock the pieces. Or how Moore's recent sculptures concentrate on, quote, what is experienced in running one's hands over a body, responding more sharply to its hardnesses and softnesses, unquote. Here again we can connect his distinctive writing on Moore to other artists in the 60s, such as Bridget Riley, of Free's Broken Circle, he wrote in 1963 that, we feel that we are twisting the circles out of shape with our hands as we might bend a piece of metal. And Jonathan's spoken about kind of, the overwhelming influence of Michael Fried and art, about, art and Objects Hood around this time, and Fried's essay on two sculptures by Caro had appeared in Art Forum earlier in 1968, again using a, an approach informed by phenomenology to articulate the distinctive experience of Caro's work. But I think 
as an aside, I think Sylvester, as again, sort of anticipating this, is interesting to look at because while he was in Paris in the late 40s with Giacometti and Palazzi, Sylvester also wrote about Paul Clay for um, Le Temps Moderne and Merleau Ponty and Sartre's journal, which was a text which was edited by Merleau Ponty. So, kind of, I come back to this idea of Sylvester's kind of anticipating um, many of the same kind of tools that come to be repurposed by Freed after Merleau Ponty is translated into English. It was perhaps to find another way to express these sensations in looking at Moore's works that Sylvester and the cinematographer Walter Lasalle made a 14 minute silent film in the exhibition in which Lasalle's camera gradually pans around the sculptures. And I'd like to end by showing you the last minute of this film. While Sylvester made and often directed numerous art films during his career, he never made another like this, the value of which he described as acting as a substitute for the exhibition. So I can think Sylvester is seeing this as a form of art criticism in itself. The film is a document that allows us to align Sylvester on Moore with Fried on Caro, and to reframe Moore's position in relation to the 1960s, away from the preoccupation with Moore's status as an international celebrity, and refocusing on him as the maker of works emerging from private experience and best encountered in silence. ever seen that before. So. <laughs> That's new to me. Um, I also love the idea that Sylvester was very happy in 1968 that Moore hadn't interfered with the choice of work <laughs> because it seemed to be something that Moore liked to do in any context that he could when making exhibitions. <laughs> so um, yeah, look forward to talking in the panel discussion more. So I'm hoping our next speaker is on the screen. Yes, brilliant. So um, I'd like to welcome Alex J. Taylor. Hello, Alex. I think I'm just wave at that camera. <laughs> who is an associate professor in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at the University of Pittsburgh. His second book, Forms of Persuasion, Art and the Corporate Image in the 1960s, has been recently published by California Press. And he's also been a terror research fellow in American art at Tate. Um, and today, Alex is going to talk to us about um, the relationship between Henry Moore and Frank Stanton, and much more besides. So I'm going to hand over to you, Alex, and perhaps you can tell us before you start where you're dialing in from. Hi, um, I am I'm here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and I wish I could be with you all there, but I'm really delighted for the opportunity um, to speak. Uh, thanks to Tom and Hannah for the invitation and thanks to Charlotte um, for her help with uh, securing some of the images for my slides that I'll share with you. Um, this paper is based on, uh, it's new research that I just finished in the last couple of days, um, based on old stuff that's been sitting in some files for a while. Um, from I think about 2012, 2013, and I was really pleased to have an excuse to return to it for today. Um, the title of the paper is Men of Form, uh, Frank Stanton and Henry Moore, and I will share my slides. Um, if you don't see them, uh, my slides, could someone just um, rush up to the lectern and wave furiously? Um, otherwise, I will assume you can see them. All good? 
Okay. Um, by the mid 1950s, abstract art was beginning to look productive to American business. Consider this publicity shot of CBS president Frank Stanton. Pen in hand, watch at the ready, he lifts his gaze from the papers on his desk to look thoughtfully off into the future. It's a carefully staged shot that asks us to wonder what is on the great man's mind. And part of the answer is, I think, meant to be found on the bulletin board behind him. On the right, Stanton has pinned what appears to be a sheet of statistical information. This is probably the kind of program ratings he had pioneered since joining the network in 1935 as a freshly minted uh, doctor of psychology from Ohio State. Innovations that made him, as the New Yorker saw it, quote, one of the few men to find success despite the handicap of a PhD. But as Stanton gaze, Stanton's gaze looks past his precious graphs, a second image is also visible. Pinned behind the business data is a glimpse of another modern grid, a print of Mondrian's composition in white, black, and red from 1936. In the decade ahead, modern art would move from the margins into the very mainstream of corporate culture and Stanton would become one of this field's most effective advocates. One manifestation of this shift uh, was the rise of the corporate collection. And uh, this is um, one of the topics that I tackle in my book, Forms of Persuasion, through the example of Chase Manhattan Bank. CBS was another really important player in this field. As Stanton, oversaw the construction of the company's new headquarters in the mid 1960s, it wasn't enough then that the building was practically across the street from the Museum of Modern Art. Like Chase Manhattan and a growing list of major companies in the US and beyond, their headquarters was rigorously designed around a program of art and design that stretched across every floor of the building, down to every custom ashtray and paperclip. Stanton's plush 35th floor office was the pinnacle of this aesthetic program. And like David Rockefeller's office at Chase Manhattan that you see on the left, it was a work by Mark Rothko that received his visitors. It stacked forms representing the top rung in the, in the ladder of executive taste. <laughs> I want to use today to think about another of the works that some of you may have already spotted on the lower left of the image of Stanton's office. Uh, that is Henry Moore's working model for locking piece from 1962 and offers some preliminary thoughts about what this sculpture meant to Stanton's identity and business. As has been described elsewhere, um, Stanton worked with Moore in his role as the chairman of the Lincoln Center's art committee. He first visited Perry Green uh, in December 1961, seeking to secure, uh, secure Moore's participation in that project. Quote, he must have come to see me almost every two months, Moore later recalled of his frequent visits. Stanton purchased several more sculptures, made photographs of Moore's works stamped to indicate his own authorship, uh, and sent the artist press clippings, all ways in which he could cultivate his relationship and associations with the artist. In 1965, for instance, he sent um, Moore an erroneous New York Times story uh, that identified a sculpture as, quote, Henry Moore's Cardinal, when in fact the work was by Giacomo Manzu. This will come as news, this will come as a surprise to you, uh, joked the eagle eyed Stanton. A later missive um, drops the CBS logo from his note. Uh, and is marked instead, quote, from your New York clipping service. A self-depreciating alias, of course, but one whose irony also somehow manages to reinforce Stanton's status at the very pinnacle of American mass media. The most powerful manifestation of Stanton's authority, uh, though, was the CBS news documentary, Henry Moore, Man of Form, aired in October 1965. 
According to Showbiz Weekly Variety, there was, quote, no doubt that the TV hour on Moore was at Stanton's recommendation, growing out of the CBS Prexy's personal acquaintance with the British sculptor, end quote. The hour-long special followed the making of the Lincoln Center sculpture over the course of four years amid a grandiose soundtrack of fanfare horns and rumbling timpani. By the time it screened on the BBC, one uh, UK critic thought its, quote, inflationary claims and hushed reverence was downright embarrassing, end quote. But the film's tone was as much about the network as it was about more, as one American critic recognized. Quote, its ratings were probably abysmal, sandwiched as it was between an NBC movie and ABC's The Fugitive. We don't expect this sort of programming to prevail on our screens. It's too specialized and aesthetic for a great mass of viewers. But to present it now and then as CBS will be doing goes a long way to restoring prestige to a medium that even its non-artistic viewers are sneering at in mounting disgust. An advertisement from the innocuously named Television Information Office helps further suggest how this documentary operated within the industry's broader efforts to use highbrow programming to combat concerns over television's negative social impacts. Quote, this October and throughout the year, reads the ads copy, television will help millions of Americans to sharpen their understanding of the people and events that are shaping our world. The ad lists the CBS special below and illustrates Moore's family group in aid of its affirmative civilizing message. The Television Information Office, as you can probably guess, was no impartial, impartial public service. Set up in response to the uh, quiz show scandals um, in 1959, this was a cooperative public relations outfit bankrolled by the industry itself. Throughout the 1960s, the group used ads like this to combat calls for greater regulatory oversight by the Federal Communications Commission whose chairman, Newton Minow, had famously declared television to be, quote, a vast wasteland, a procession of game shows, formula comedies about totally unbelievable families, blood and thunder, mayhem, violence, sadism, murder, Western bad men, Western good men, private eyes, gangsters, more violence, and cartoons, end quote. <laughs> Engagements with elite culture then became a core strategy for the Television Information Office, redirecting criticisms of TV into intellectual debates about culture and democracy writ large. As its director and former CBS executive, Louis Hausman, told one interviewer, quote, no nation that supports more symphony orchestras than the rest of the world put together, where the attendance at the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art is twice as large as that of the Louvre in Paris is a nation in which mass media can be accused of taste degradation, end quote. In 1966, the group bankrolled a publication titled TV as Art for high school English teachers, arguing that, quote, as in the execution of a fresco by, the, by a master's helpers, there is no reason why men working together in TV cannot create great works of art, end quote. Stanton himself was active in related efforts to engage with scholarly criticisms of his medium. Here, for instance, is the issue of Daedalus magazine in which Stanton's defense of TV as a democratic art appears alongside and as an alternative to critical condemnations of mass culture by the likes of Hannah Arendt and James Baldwin. In Stanton's office, I want to suggest, more sculpture was drawn into this discourse by which great works of art helped deflect criticisms over the quality of American television. This is not to deny the meanings that the work of course had for more, nor indeed the varied uses that it could serve in the corporate context. Certainly its craggy organic form helped offset the cold rigors of modernist architecture qualities that had also merited Moore's art for many corporate plazas. 
The idea that big business favored abstraction in the 1960s for its symbolic ambiguity and openness has sometimes been used to suggest that it mattered little precisely what works of art it suggested, it selected. And sometimes I think this was true. Here, for example, uh, is one of Florence Knoll's sketch designs for Stanton's office at CBS, a drawing for a small antechamber off the main office. On the lower right, just beside my caption, um, Knoll marks a squiggle in black ink and two shades of green colored pencil as quote, plant or sculpture. As though either, <laughs> as though either object might equally uh, fulfill her uh, formal goals uh, just as well as each other. But the sketch of the main office area of Stanton's office is more specific about the works by Moore and Klein that would eventually dominate this view, indicating that the presence of these objects was more carefully planned. Part of the reason for this was, I think, the correspondence between Stanton's reputation and the representation of Moore's unceasing attention to, to detail that dominated the CBS television special, and thus, in a way, the company's own understanding of his art. Stanton, too, was a man known as a, quote, quiet perfectionist, who paid attention to the details designing the taut organizational structure of the CBS empire, end quote. For the design of the network's new headquarters, he was, like magazine reported, quote, determined to mold each small part into the whole, the omnipotent vision that presided across all aspects of the corporate image, here the very embodiment of its iconic logo. Once in Stanton's office, wrote another, visitors witnessed a man who had, quote, devoted his life to perfecting every detail that comes across his desk, end quote. From this vantage point, Stanton's line of sight to Moore's sculpture would have provided, I suspect, a convenient context to reinforce the discipline and precision of his own corporate vision. Locking piece allowed such qualities to be observed in aesthetic form. As Herbert Reed described, this work's elements, quote, seem to interlock with the perfection of a puzzle with the inv inevitability of one and only one solution. Beyond the singular rightness of Moore's form, Reed further noted that locking piece resembled a clenched fist, an association, I think, with particular suitability at this epicenter of corporate authority. We can assume, actually, that Stanton probably read these descriptions because they were printed alongside his own photographs of the Lincoln Center sculpture in Reed's book with credit to him, and in so doing, further yoking his vision to Moore's art. There's one newspaper source that provides even more specific evidence that Stanton used Moore's sculpture to broach questions about taste with visitors to his office. Here is the opening sentence um, of uh, a newspaper profile uh, published in May 1966. Dr. Frank Stanton, president of CBS, was looking at a bronze Henry Moore sculpture in his office. And then it continues. I bought Moore's locking piece, he said. At first, people would come in and be sort of horror stricken. Now they say, gee, this really looks pretty good. The point here was not just to establish Stanton's own advanced taste ahead of the curve of his constituents. In the paragraphs ahead, Stanton was asked by the interviewer whether he thought television could change public tastes. He replies, quote, I have given a lot of thought to it, talked to people in sociology and social science, but I haven't seen any evidence of it, end quote. Stanton notes then the coexistence of elite and popular art. He writes, quote, you live on a number of levels simultaneously, but that doesn't mean you put on death of a salesman or the philharmonic. Believe me, if I found there was more response, we would do it more often. Stanton's emphasis here on reactions and responses insists that while he can measure public taste, he cannot shape it. He might have responded to Henry Moore, 
but his audiences still wanted Gilligan's Island, even after the benefit of the exposure that CBS could provide. At the end of the interview, interview Stanton returns again to Moore to emphasize his focus on and faith in the measurement of audience reaction. It reads, Stanton dreams of a kind of pastoral future in the arts when he retires. Quote, I want to do a book on Henry Moore, not a picture book of sculptures, but I'd like to take some of his more important works. I'd like to go to where they are and talk to the people who have lived with them. The real test, he said wistfully, is how people react. Far from an occasional reference, and I'm gonna go back to this image. Far from an occasional reference um, or, or temporary kind of association, Stanton's connection with Moore became a persistent uh, aspect of his late career identity. When Moore visited Stanton's office in 1967, the fact that the artist accidentally went to the building of competitor ABC somehow provided an excuse for press coverage of their meeting. When Stanton retired in 1973, his gift from company founder William Paley was a maquette of Moore's atom piece inscribed on its base as a gift from the company. Reporting on Stanton's last day at CBS, the New Yorker noted that he left the building carrying a photograph of his wife and a copy of D. San Lazaro's book, Homage to Henry Moore. And when Moore died, the association between the pair remained strong enough for the New York Times to approach Stanton alongside Met curator Bill Lieberman and architect Ian Pei to write a personal reflection on their friendship. Stanton never published the book he imagined, but the idea was not entirely unrealized. In November 1967, Stanton made an elegant spiral bound photo book that records the encounters between Moore's art and its elite patrons at the house of his friend, the architect Gordon Bunshaft and Bunshaft's wife, Nina. Moore was the guest of honor at the event. And as the chic title page lists, the other guests were Laura and James Sweeney and Ruth and Frank Stanton. Guests at the Bunshafts East, Hampton, East Hampton House are shown in animated conversation with Moore. His artworks often occupy uh, the spaces between artist and patron. Other images record human encounters with his sculpture. Uh, in one, Moore reaches out to touch his seated woman thin neck of 1961, and in another, Bunshaft silhouette towers over the artist's recent three rings. Stanton sent his highbrow scrapbooking project to Moore and asked for his help to make it an even more precious record of their relationship. Quote, in assembling the pictures, it occurred to me that it might be a surprise if I could include in the book an inscription from you. I am enclosing a print which might serve for this purpose. Moore obliged, and Stanton wrote again to offer his thanks. Quote, I cannot begin to tell you how delighted Ruth and I are to have your book with its warm inscription. Your friendship means a lot to us, and we will cherish this volume, end quote. When I first came across this kind of strange object at the Henry Moore archive some years ago, I was not sure what to make of it. But returning to it for today, I think the key is to be found in the volume, um, uh, in the 1966 interview from which I read before. Quote, I'd like to go to where they are and talk to the people who have lived with them, he said. The real test is how people react. Stanton's volume not only reaffirmed, reaffirmed his admiration for more, but confirmed his focus on the response of its viewers whether those at the pinnacle of modern arts elite patronage networks with whom he identified, or the rather different preferences of television audiences upon whose eyes his business relied. 
From behind his desk at CBS, Moore's sculpture flaunted uh, Stanton's own advanced taste and aesthetic expertise. But he exercised this judgment to validate it, his faith in the consumer democracy of a media empire designed to give audiences what he reckoned they wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Can you see me again? So, yes, I yeah. can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another um, brilliant presentation and other objects that I've also not seen before. I wasn't aware of that book in the archive here, so that was really wonderful to see. Um, so I'm going to now introduce our final speaker this afternoon, who can also hopefully see me, John. Yes, I can. Yeah, great. Again. great, great. So um, welcome to you, John. John J. Curley is an Associate Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art um, at the Rubin and sorry, and Rubin Faculty Fellow at Wake Forest University. He is also the Paul Mellon Centre Mid-Career Fellow for 22 to 23. Um, and he has published widely on post-war American European art, including a 2021 article on um, Cold War cultures of rationality. Um, he is working on lots of exciting projects, it sounds like, including um, a long essay on Caro, <laughs> drawing on research carried out, um, as I understand it, at the Institute in 2015. And I'm sure some of that will form part of what he's talking to us today about. So thank you very much, Jay. I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much. Can you hear me okay, first of all? Yes, great. Yes, yeah. great. And uh, first of all, thanks to Tom and Hannah for organizing organize the event. And like uh, like Alex, I wish I could be there in person. I do love the north of England, so um, I wish I was there. Um, and as, um, as, as Jennifer mentioned, this is some older research. I actually gave a really early version of this talk at the HMI in Leeds back in 2009. So it's been kicking around for a long time. So I'm really pleased to come back to it um, with this invitation uh, to present here. And I should say, like everyone else, like, like a lot of the other presenters, I am not a Henry Moore specialist. Um, so that's we'll just go without saying. Um, but hopefully this talk can on Caro can unlock some new avenues. And I think it really does work well in dialogue with many of the other talks we've heard today. And I'm going to start with a quote from David Sylvester. So that goes right back to um, what we heard just a few minutes ago. In 1961, art critic David Sylvester had an unusual experience with one of Anthony Caro's painted steel sculptures. Some years later, he wrote, quote, the horse of 1961 had been the dominant piece in the second Situation Group show. I had vis visited the exhibition on a Saturday morning with my two-year-old daughter. And when I encouraged her in the presence of other visitors I knew to climb onto the Caro and walk up and down the slope, it had been a deliberate act of provocation. I treated the piece as a piece of a playground apparatus to imply that it was an object rather than a sculpture." Unquote. The display of the horse in the New London situation was Caro's first publicly exhibited painted steel sculpture. And here is the catalog page. And at this foundational moment, it was a stage for theatrical action. I begin my talk with Sylvester's somewhat patronizing story as it implies an alternative or secret history of Caro's first welded steel sculptures that have since become emblems of a distanced, refined high modernism. This repressed history will, will be the subject of my talk today. When scholars discuss Caro's work from this period, like midday from, 1960s, from 1960, he is, to put it generally, thought of in one of two conflicting ways. First, he's a high modernist, a sculptor committed to making works that, in the words of Clement Greenberg, escape, quote, the, st the structural logic, logic of ordinary, ponderable things, unquote. Like the paintings of Kenneth Nolan from the same period seen at bottom, Caro's sculptures purport to resist the easy pleasures of mass culture. Caro's most important critic in this period, Greenberg acolyte Michael Fried, concurred. For Fried, the steel sculptures transcend their constituent parts through a, quote, achieve weightlessness, unquote, and a, quote, elusive opticality, unquote. They attain a presentness that suspends time. This remains the tenor for much of the literature on Caro's steel sculpture from the 1960s. Second, because of his innovative teaching at Central St. Martin's, Caro is often considered the so-called father of British new generation sculptors like Philip King and others who emerged slightly later like Barry Flanagan. New generation sculpture, especially Flanagan's anti-form pieces comprised of things like rope and sand as in this work from 1966, operate against the ideas espoused by Greenberg and Fried. 
The modernist nemesis of anti-art and the ready-made is on full display here. And Caro's open-ended teaching style and curriculum at St. Martin's inspired Flanagan and many of these sculptors of the mid to late 1960s. So how can, how can we reconcile these antithetical positions? The, Amer the quote unquote American modernist versus the father of a school of British sculpture that at least approaches the postmodern. In this talk, I wanna suggest that these two positions are not so much in opposition, but rather inherent to Caro's sculptural practice between 1955 and 1965. What I mean by this is that it is essential to view a sculpture like Midday as informed not just by theories of American modernism, but also informed by the anti-modernist theories of a certain branch of the independent group. Excavating the secret history will resituate Caro as a complex mediator of diverse and ostensibly contradictory traditions. By this logic, midday can compel the modernist conviction associated with American critics and address the broader trans medium concerns of the independent group. Commentators often mention, briefly mention Caro's ties in the 1950s to certain members of the independent group, namely the faction comprised of Eduardo Palazzi, Nigel Henderson, and the architects Allison and Peter Smithson, seen here in one of the promotional posters for This Is Tomorrow. But scholars have not explored these important friendships in relationship to Caro's actual work. Caro befriended Allison and Peter Smithson while training at the Royal Academy Schools in London from 1947 to 1952. And Caro was even a client of the architects, as he asked them in 1954 to convert his stables and coach house in Hampstead into a studio, one of the architects' earliest completed works. The Smithsons then introduced Caro to Henderson and Palazzi. Henderson soon became one of the primary photographers of Caro's work in the 1950s. In this letter from 1957 to his friend, Caro was ordering reprints of some of these photographs. And you can say, see at the top, it says, my dear Nigel. This is from, from Caro. These bits of evidence demonstrate that Caro had both personal and professional relationships with members of the independent group during this crucial 1953 to 57 period. This was the same period, same time that the Smithsons, Palazzi and, the Henders and Henderson worked on some of the most important exhibitions connected with the independent group. In 1953, the four of them organized Parallel of Life and Art, a show that made a strong impression on Caro, according to his biographer, Ian Barker. The organizers took found photographs, excised from art serials, popular picture magazines, scientific journals, newspapers, and other sources, enlarged them, and created the chaotic all-over environment on view here. In this image, for instance, a head carved from whalebone is hanging near a microscopic cross-section of a plant. Independent group member Reiner Bonham highlighted these two photographs in his 1953 review of the show saying, quote, they come from societies and technologies almost unimaginably different. And yet, to camera-eyed Western man, the visual equivalence is unmistakable and perfectly convincing, unquote. The show dramatizes the way Caro's friends, Henderson, Pilazzi, and the Smithsons, structured a practice on appropriating ready-made found images and objects in order to defamiliarize them. The exhibition also included photographic reproductions of works of art by Alberto Burri, Jean Dubuffet, as well as an image of Jackson Pollock in his studio, suggesting a confusion between photographs of art and other decidedly non-art images. An image from Parallel of Life and Art appeared in an article about, about, about new brutalism by, by Rainer Bonham, published in Architectural Review in late 1955. Bonham also selected other images for the page, including a Pollock painting, a sackcloth work by Alberta Burry, and a Henderson photograph of Fons Graffito. Parallel of life and art, as well as appropriated objects and images more generally, were of crucial importance to Bonham's understanding of new brutalism. Um, represented here with images of lower right of, of plans of the Smithson's Soho House project and a photograph of the completed Hostanton School. Bonham chose all three of these images for their raw and expressive use of structures and materials. An aesthetic of anti-beauty was the guiding principle of the page. While not directly involved with the independent group or with new brutalism, Caro did have shared visual concerns at this point. This is clear by looking at Caro alongside Magda Cordell, whose sculpture Bonham included in his photo essay. It could almost be mistaken for Caro's work of this period, like Woman Waking Up from 1955, seen right. Additionally, Caro's new brutalist as found strategies of appropriation in it can be seen in his own work at this time. 
1956, he incorporated objects like pebbles into his sculptures and also used pebbles as models for a series of smiling head sculptures, as, this, as in this example from 1956 seen here. For inspiration, Caro apparently sought pebbles that were suggestive of human heads. This interest in new brutalist and independent group ideas becomes apparent in a 1974 interview in which Caro compares his practice with that of a picture magazine's editor, um, saying, quote, I used stones, but they were more sharded and, 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 and the sculptures were even more intense in the way, and rather the way that a photograph is chosen for Tempo or Life magazine, because that is the very moment that sums up, say, the man lighting up his cigarette. I used to look at photographs in those magazines because they chose the photograph which gave that moment, unquote. Not unlike the organizers of Parallel of Life and Art, Caro thought of his own transformations around 1955, at least partially through photography. And also we see this in the, um, you know, in the, uh, in the cover of First, which we saw this image earlier, um, which is, this is a detail of a plaster cast of Caro's um, sculpture, Seated Woman. And so again, that ambiguity is also shown, displayed by other students at St. Martin's and reproducing Caro's work in this very ambiguous fashion here. <clears throat> Nigel Henderson's photographs of Caro's sculpture from this period further emphasize this understanding, presenting the work at times as akin to raw and discarded objects. Consider Henderson's picture of woman waking up from 1955, placed on top of scattered sheets of newspaper. Henderson depicts a sculpture as if it was discovered in the trash or in an abandoned, bombed out lot. At this point, Caro seems to relish the ways that photographs can reinvent his sculptures, even increasing their sense of brutality and abstraction. So far, I've tried to I've attempted, I've attempted to situate Caro's work of the mid to late 1950s as participating in a dialogue, albeit from a slight distance with the independent group members interested in new brutalism, especially ideas of misreading found objects and photographs based on formerly expressive properties. But what about Caro's painted steel sculptures, which he began in 1960? How might they be new brutalist? Thinking about architecture can help with these questions. The Smithson's architectural plans for the Soho House and especially the photographs of Hustanton with its rigid and harsh geometries of steel I-beams does not seem to reflect the barely controlled chaos and rough aesthetic of Bonham's other inspirations on the page. Yes, materials are not disguised in any of these images and there is a facticity about them all, but Pollock and others have a sense of, have a visual sense of anti-order that Hustanton does not. This divergence exposes the way that the essence of new brutalism was for the Smithsons and Bonham, an ethical proposition, not merely a stylistic one. This raises an important point in relationship to Anthony Caro. If one can consider Hunstanton with its eye beams that simultaneously exhibit significant materiality and create um, a sense of openness and refinement as new brutalist, might we also situate Caro's painted steel sculptures along these lines? Caro's abandonment of lumpy figures and his move into abstract steel, steel sculptures has been largely attributed to two interconnected events. First was Clement Greenberg's 1959 studio visit, where he told the artist apparently that the sculptures weren't, quote, up to the mark, unquote. Second was Caro's subsequent trip to America that we've already heard about that same year, during which he saw the modernist work of Kenneth Nolan and others in person. Famously, Caro constructed his first abstract steel sculpture, 24 hours in 1960, on his return to London, and later that same year, he made Midday. It is clear that Caro learned a lot from his exposure to American ideas, as his work did change significantly. However, while modernist ideas of weightlessness, optical effects, and a drive towards some kind of pure, unmediated expression certainly inform Midday, it, al it also, I want to argue, relies on transformations of as-found materials an idea indebted to new brutalism. Caro's own recollections about finding materials for these early canonical sculptures reveals this as found quality. Um, he, he once said in an interview, quote, I went down to the docks when I got back from America and found pieces of beams, big H beams, also rough pieces that had been cut out of bridges and then got a lorry and got them back here to my studio, unquote. Another account describes Caro visiting industrial scrapyards in Canningtown in East London for his materials for his new working process. Like his transformations of pebbles into sculptures, Caro reimagines these as found in industrial materials into something else entirely. 
Early critics often noted the industrial or engineering connotations of Carr's materials. In a review of his 1963 Whitechapel exhibition, Charles Spencer in Art Review wrote, quote, girders and metal bars are usually associated with cold, unemotional situations, even brutality, unquote. Spencer's choice of the word brutality suggests that new brutalism perhaps was not so far from the, from the inherent visual syntax of Caro's sculptures in the early 1960s. While I do not want to discount the American modernist forces at work in Caro's sculpture, it is clear that the situation is far more complex than often assumed. Works like Midday must be viewed as a hybrid between an American point of view and one that, that is distinctly British, namely the new brutalism associated with the Smithsons and Bonham. Before his introduction to Greenberg and Noland, Cara worked to convey the raw power of rugged materials. After his trip, after his trip, he's still transforming found objects, but now transforming them into sculptures that fulfill the requirements of American modernism. Put another way, the process and materials are consistent with Bonham's theories, but the results are modernist works of art that also push against the anti-art tendencies of new brutalism. They are as found objects that also transcend their as found quality. Thus, Midday is not a clean break with the works of the 1950s, but an attempt to reconfigure them via Greenberg and Freed into a distinctly transatlantic hybridity. I wanna close by complicating the story further as the theories of Caro's best known critic, Michael Freed, actually recall some of the Smithsons' ideas relative to new brutalism. Despite the different mediums, the Smithsons and Freed are in a sense writing about the same kinds of materials, the I-beams, the steel plates and trusses shared by both Caro's sculptures and the Smithsons' buildings. What's especially striking is that, is that their critical vocabulary is also similar. One of the best known images of new brutalism is the Smithsons' entry for the Golden Lane housing competition for a site in East Central London, especially this deep perspectival drawing with collage photographs cut from magazines. For the Smithsons, their entry offered a new kind of housing for a new kind of city. Their decks are what they call the, quote, streets in the air, unquote, were to them the, quote, equivalent to the street form of the present day, unquote. Examining Henderson's contemporary photographs of social interaction in the East End, seen on the right, certainly pushed the Smithsons, as Ben Highmore has shown, to think about an ethics of social architecture, to design buildings where communities could withstand the increasing commercialization and homogenization of urban space. This was architecture to promote interaction and local community. Like the Smithsons, Freed was also interested in ideas of sociability, albeit of a more abstract type. Such notions emerge in, in his 1963 essay for Caro's Whitechapel exhibition, in which he ends his remarks with comparing the painted steel sculptures to a kind of abstract, abstract utopian communication. He writes, quote, in Caro's more successful sculpture, one discovers the elusive syntax of our own purest and most passionate gestures, used to construct gestures even more pure and passionate and armed beside with what one hopes it, is, it still makes sense to speak of in our time as the durability of art, unquote. For Freed, Caro's work is distilled gesture, reminding viewers about transcending the usual limits of communication. Like Golden Lane, Freed's Caro is interested in giving form to sociability in light of an increasingly alienated consumer society. One version is modernist and sculptural, the other is architectural, built in real space. Freed also described the, quote, achieve weightlessness, unquote, of a sculpture like Midday, the way that what should be a weighty aspect of the work actually appears to defy gravity, like the tilted I-beams floating on its slope. For him, weightlessness was an analog to a euphoria of transcending traditional limits. Likewise, certain modernist tower blocks from this era also used such a language of weightlessness, especially as portrayed in the fashion and architectural press. Perhaps John, perhaps John Cowan's fashion photo photography, here an image featuring Jill Kennington, captures this sense of possibility and transcendence in London's reconstruction architecture that Freed also intuits in Caro's sculpture. Kennington's own gesture of euphoria here set off against the brutalism of linear steel and concrete uh, almost recalls the expressiveness of a painted steel sculpture by Caro. I'm remind, I realize that such a cross-medium comparison runs the risk of sounding overdetermined, but through the lens of new brutalism and the independent group, which was based on just such ideas of cross-pollination, Caro's development between the sculptures of the 1950s and the painted steel of the 1960s 
seems less like a break than an accommodation with his recent American influences. Instead of making work that appeared as found, giving them a raw directness he craved, Caro incorporated these materials in a way that reflects the aims, <clears throat> the aims and ideas of American modernism. Might we say that he is combining the aesthetics of protopop with those championed by Greenberg and Fried? This duality between the as found and modernist ideas is perhaps most clear in Caro's well-known early one morning from 1962. As Rosalind Krauss's classic interpretation in her Passages in Modern Sculpture, published in 1977, suggests, we often get two mutually exclusive views of the work. From the side, the lateral object that one can look down upon, one that exists in the same physical space as the viewer. From the front, the opposite, an image that discourages us from looking down, a vertical assembly that denies its own physicality. Here, Caro is hedging his bets, perhaps implying his hybridity through photographic reproductions. Viewers both see a strange object made from urban scraps and one that denies all evidence to the contrary. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for that brilliant um, presentation. I'm still trying to work out what you can both see. Just, just, just that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I know how difficult it is to participate in um, panel discussions when you, you can't see the audience. Um, so I hope that um, you'll bear with us on that. I don't know whether maybe it's better if I sort of stay here rather than... I think I can see you if you sit down. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> we should, we should turn the, the, the camera around at some point. Oh, there we are. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, thank you, um, everybody, for those um, brilliant uh, talks. And there was a lot of crossover, I think, in particular in terms of thinking about um, Moore's own image, his public image, um, and the extent to which he was sort of complicit in the shaping of that and how others. Um, wanted to shape that for him I suppose. Uh, I could I could open it up but I might just while we while we have midday in our minds because we saw it so um, recently on the screen John I might just ask you whether or not um, you could comment on for me midday is the sculpture that we sort of most often use to kind of um, think about Caro in this this shifting moment in, in the early 60s. And it's a particularly um, important work for me because I, I always think of it in um, the open air in 1963, where it was exhibited in the LCC exhibition. And this was, um, as many of you may know, an exhibition which I always go on about. But um, it was quite important where there was a showing of US sculpture in um, sort of contrast, very specifically constructed as contrast to British sculpture. And Caro was included in this exhibition as a British artist, and his midday was shoved to the extremities of the park, um, being the only sculpture that was, you know, um, in metal and also in colour, essentially. And this was sort of 1963. So at that point, you know, it was very much Reed's construction of this, but also the critical um, reception of that show was very much that this was still sort of, um, you know, on the fringes. So I'm, I'm just interested to hear from you why it's that work that in particular that is sort of so contested maybe um, when thinking about this moment of Sakaro. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, in the larger version of this project, I'm really am thinking about London reconstruction architecture in terms of Caro. And I think this idea of this open air exhibition, it was in Battersea, is that right? Am I, am I mistaken? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In Battersea Park, and this idea that you know, in some ways, this you know, this sculpture with its I beams and with its sort of you know industrial materials, could perhaps remind Londoners of sort of this sort of you know of a of an erasure of history. And I think Londoner, you know, at least this idea that around sixty between sixty and sixty three, there was this seeming you know effort of the you know of swinging London of the economic sort of um, you know the economic success of uh, of London and Great Britain that was you know happening at that moment. That these sculptures were, you know, tied to that, and I don't know. I mean, I guess there's also this moment too, where I feel like, you know, this is post 1958, post New American Painting, post the Jackson Pollock show at the Whitechapel, 
and there was a sort of early, um, I think this need is to like to assert some sort of Britishness and I feel like Caro almost seemed too American at that point, you know, to sort of con in, in contrast with Moore's bronze and the, you know, the, the smooth surfaces of, of Moore shore, but they are sort of that old model of, of sculpture. And I was really drawn by, um, by James's image of, of, you know, Sylvester's catalog showing more next to Michelangelo and next to the Parthenon sculptures. And in some ways, you know, Caro seemed too pop, you know, sort of before, you know, before the UK had fully embraced sort of pop by 64, 65, 66. So I feel like, I feel like sort of that real transition moment, um, 63, where Caro might have seemed too American, but I don't know, I'm speculating here. And I wonder, um, if slightly connected to that, if um, Alex, I could ask you a bit more about this notion of, um, I suppose, Moore's sculpture acting as this sort of civilising message for um, Stanton and for the network. So I was really interested in that because I feel like maybe, I mean, that was very much kind of shaped in the 1950s for Moore's works as far as I understand. You know, there were lots of initiatives where um, more sculpture was being used as a civilizing power, as sort of breaking down barriers, democratization of public sculpture through Arts Council, LCC initiatives. So it's quite interesting that Stanton sort of used him in particular as this kind of civilizing message. And I wonder if, if that's just to do with their personal relationship or do you think there's something to do with sort of his Britishness as well that came into play there? Um, <clears throat> Britishness perhaps, certainly um, foreignness was clearly useful uh, in terms of, you know, I, I, I still think in a certain um, configuration of uh, an idea of advanced art, um, that being something that happened somewhere else, um, regardless of what the evidence of America's, uh, you know, the move of modern art to the United States. Um, uh, it, you know, the, 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 the question about, I mean, obviously what I've delivered is in large part an, a, a, a paper about Stanton, not a paper about Moore. And um, I, you know, I do have a sense, however, that more um, both had a stake in and understood what was going on. His own kind of canny uh, interest in his mass media representations um, mean that I think he isn't, you know, he isn't merely being used in this, that there is a kind of mutual push and pull going on um, in um, Moore's participation in that kind of um, myth making. Um, in a general sense, even if not sort of with quite the same specificity as I suggest um, uh, his work might have served for Stanton at, you know, given very specific kind of strategic imperatives in the, in the, in the company at that moment. But yeah, that, um, yeah, thank you for that question. And is, is there any evidence for more sort of um, inputting into the way that that um, man of form film was produced because he was, he did seem to be a master of this in terms of you know, controlling to some extent his own public image. Yeah, I mean the film's incredible, um, it, and um, of course his his influence and agency is all over it because he is interviewed um, and um, he is participating in that narrative. Um, uh, the you know the correspondence between him and Stanton it's it's sort of noteworthy on reflection that I showed a bunch of Stanton stuff but I didn't show much of the correspondence in the other direction and it does exist it tends to be kind of like polite chatter that seems like more is kind of um, you know cultivating a client uh, essentially um, so uh, but I you know so I think that for more perhaps the stakes were not as specific as they were for Stanton, um, but there certainly is a kind of, you know, they're playing ball together would be how I'd put it. Thank you. Can I follow up with a question to Alex real quick? Oh, please do, yes. Thank sure, you. I just, you know, looking at Locking Piece, Alex, I loved your, your whole interpretation of that room, the office is brilliant. I just wondered the way that Locking Piece itself is these sort of two aspects that are kind of together is that 
somehow could allegorize sort of the mass media relationship to fine art and has this sort of like awkward tension, but you know, but Stanton is really trying hard to keep them together. It might be too much of a stretch, but I feel like there's something really interesting about that tension and that sculptural form that really resonated with your, with the way you spoke about his passion and his interest in, you know, in democratizing the fine arts for a mass audience. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's really lovely. Um, and thank you, useful. Um, I, you know, I, I really quite genuinely have this imagination of Stanton sitting behind that desk and, you know, pontificating about the more before him with visitors in various ways. And, and, and so I think, you know, with the evidence of that interview where it kind of seems to be, uh, so much of the discussion seems to be oriented around this kind of presence in the room that would it would easy easy to be think of it you know that it didn't matter whether it was a plant or a sculpture right but like clearly it does matter and at some level I think for Stanton it matters what the thing you know have what the form of the thing looks like and so you know what would be delightful is to actually have some traces of Stanton you know doing that kind of description as indeed there are other examples of um, you know, corporate liberal executives in the 60s, you know, fancying themselves as kind of art critics, um, but doing it in terms that sound startlingly similar to um, the businesses in which they were in. Um, I don't have any kind of nugget like that in this case, but um, I certainly have fantasized about the existence of it. I think the, the um, film is in the exhibition, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, sorry. So we can all go and see that. that. Hopefully. Up and up. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm on. Um, yeah, so not all of the film, not the whole hour, but about 20 minutes is that CBS film is playing the exhibition. Um, well, I've got the mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I had a couple of observations, partly in response to your comment, um, uh, Jenny, which is I wonder in terms of that parallel between more in the 50s and, um, you yeah, know, humanism and civil, the civilizing factor, even though it's kind of interesting given the subject of this, but also then the um, film again in uh, for CBS, it just made me think about the first ever um, documentary that was made about war was, of course, on reclining for the festival by the BBC. Um, you know, so by the time he's doing this in the 60s, it's kind of like it's not his first rodeo in the whole um, you know, presentation of the evolution of a work in that way. Because, um, of course, he talked about the evolution of uh, the Lincoln Center figure. Um, and then the other thing that actually, Jay, you commented on just beautifully segueing to my question, which is around all three papers mentioned, um, sometimes kind of lightly, um, but noticeably to me, this sense of a, of a tactile, of a, of a sort of, I mean, there was uh, your quotes, um, I think James about Reed talking about the sort of straining of muscles in the, in the locking piece and then um, this kind of, um, this action of twisting and this sort of hard and soft. Um, there was uh, this notion of the gesture in your work, uh, in your paper, Jay, and, and Cara's making gestures. Um, and even actually in, in your, um, as you also mentioned, uh, locking piece. And I just wonder how much that may be, um, that sense of active uh, you know, participation in the sculpture, the viewer focus that you talk about, Alex, you know, is a sort of, way of, I don't know, to, to what extent is it kind of characterizing the, um, the critical reception to more in this time? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can go. Um, yeah, it was, um, I was thinking about this because, I mean, Locking Peace is really interesting and um, obviously Alex um, quotes Reed's um, interpretation of that piece, um, whereas Sylvester basically has the opposite. So I think they must be two different I was trying to figure this out, um, but I think they must have been two different casts of the same bronze. And there was one lent from the artist for the Tate exhibition in 68. But um, yeah, so Reed is talking about looking at it and kind of the two pieces, you know, fitting together like the only solution to a puzzle, whereas Sylvester talks about it in terms of, you know, like imagining yourself like straining to pull the two pieces apart. So I suppose that's just, um, those two papers were just really fortuitous in highlighting just how um, different critics can arrive at kind of diametrically opposed uh, readings of the same work, which I think is, is useful. Um, and I think in terms of the experience, it's also kind of interesting that Jay quoted that kind of 
Sylvester being the editor of, you know, encouraging kids to walk, walk her, um, daughter to mm-hmm. walk over the, the Caro sculpture. So, I mean, I suppose we're also kind of at the beginnings of um, kind of, we're coming into kind of happenings and, and installation and participatory art. And I mean, I think that's like that, that whole like anecdote is like a, a, like a whole thing that I won't go into. But I mean, I think the fact that he's like bringing that up as like some sort of like test case for, uh, you know, what, what the art is doing is, you know, how, how you interact with it, I think is probably uh, useful in this context. Um, and I think that also um, kind of, and obviously that's what, that's what the film is all about. It's like, it, it seems to me that it's like those very like close pans and, you know, like how close you get to kind of the grain of the, the wooden reclining figure is kind of some attempt to kind of encourage the spectator to, you know, like as close as is possible with the medium to actually kind of imagine yourself there being very close to it. And there are other shots in that same film where he sort of like comes, you know, between the legs of a reclining figure and basically like zooms in kind of like in a way that's like like jarringly fast as if to like imagine or to try and simulate the kind of, um, kind of, kind of, kind of, disjunctures and you know the kind of like feeling yourself into the work that can happen while you're standing in front of it so I think that that's I mean that's something that we can maybe talk to further in terms of like reproductive technologies and how they kind of participate in um, the reception of these works I think what Jay was saying about um, Henderson's photographs of Caro is, is really fascinating so how these how these artists and their commentators are using the available media whether it's um, words photographs or moving image to communicate what they want to say about um, what that physical experience is of being in the presence of a work. I think that's something that links the paper to the work. John and Alex, do you want to add anything to that? Um, uh, not specifically to that, but I'm. there is one question that I actually have for um, Jay that I think um, I, I can't resist but ask um so the 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 pebble the the Cara's use of pebbles for the little kind of portraity works that you showed um you know in the in the context of talking and thinking about more I think so directly point to Moore's you know uh process of using pebbles and bones and and the like um but you know with the presence of that quotation um, in which Caro is looking towards, um, you know, nothing less industrial in its form than Life magazine, as a, as a, in your um, connection, a, a kind of way of handling that image. I wonder what you thought about. Um, well, it, it strikes me that it reminds us that Moore is a, an artist also working with found materials. Is the first thing. Um, and then, so I wondered what, what you thought about like Caro, you know, is for Caro then the big transition um, about moving from natural found materials to industrial ones? Might that be a way to think about that? Yeah, and also think, you know, I think the sort of the breaking point of, you know, the war as well. So, you know, you know I'm no more special, but more is doing that in the thirties, right? Sort of think, you know, I know he's, I know he's basing things on, basing things on, you know, bird skeletons, even in the 60s show, I, you know, I watched some videos from the brilliant show that I can't see. Um, but I feel like the actual found stuff, you know, is a little bit earlier. But I think it's really fascinating that, you know, for Caro, he's in those early works, he's trying to find this sort of, you know, sort of changeability between the natural and the artificial. So it's, you know, again, he compares that process to the, that of a photo editor. Um, he has them photographed by Nigel Henderson, oftentimes with like, you know, with a newspaper view on, you know, underneath it. So there is a sort of strange sort of hybridity between this sort of pre-war natural sort of thinking about a new romanticism, then to sort of thinking more about this sort of independent group as found uh, mentality. So you're, you're, you're exactly right. I'm still trying to sort of parse out the answer to that. But I think it's, you know, looking at all these Henry Moore images today, it's, you're reminded too that although he's working in bronze and plaster and carved stone, those works do look like, you know, especially the, you know, the quote unquote turds on plazas. I should use this in the hollow halls of the Henry Moore studio, but like the idea that these look like natural forms that have been dropped into these plazas. So they almost look like, you know, natural relics within this sort of these, uh, you know, these urban, these post-war urban plazas. And even in Frank Stanton's office that Henry Moore, as you so eloquently put it, Alex, you know, that sort of the 
you know, mid-century modern refinement of the, of the surroundings really emphasizes the cragginess, the sort of the difference of Henry Moore. Um, so all that to say is that I feel like Moore do that they look like sort of prehistoric as found objects, you know, and I'm still wrestling with what that means for Caro in that mid 50s period, but I appreciate your, your question to push me to think more about it. I'm going to pass the microphone on. I'm going to make one comment because it's just a comment and not a question. Um, Moore actually owns um, a cast of um, Caro's Man's Man and a Cigarette. And it's in the house. Um, just there. It's in the heart. Which sculpture? Um, sorry, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't catch the sculpture. The Caro. Sorry. The Caro, the man's Man's Making a Cigarette. Man's Making a Cigarette. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, those photographs with the, on the newspaper were so extraordinary. I've never seen this before, but this really made me look differently. Um, but no, this is a question to Alex because um, you're talking about the foreignness of um, war sculpture as part of its allure. But um, obviously, there's also American painting in those rhythms. There's Rocco and there's Klein. Um, so, can you speak to just a little bit about his broader art collecting and the role that Moore might have played? Within that, you know, was uh, he clearly had a special relationship with Moore and, and his work, but is there a kind of cohesive aesthetic program that we can discern? Are there other sculptors? Are there other British sculptors? Just really curious about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I mean, what's really interesting once you um, start to, I find really interesting once you start to look at uh, um, executive offices in um, New York international style buildings in the 60s is that they all start to look remarkably the same. There was a, there was a very consistent preference for certain kinds of um, uh, modernist practice. And, um, you know, there's certainly a kind of network of... Um, patronage relationships that are being established between executives and collectors, where I think that they're all kind of, in the end, copying each other in a certain expression of um, what it meant to be, you know, to have advanced taste. Um, uh, so um, more does kind of, so the thing to say is that the paintings that are, you know, in Stanton's office, are very similar to the kinds of works you would see in other offices of equivalently positioned um, folks at other companies at Chase Manhattan or at Seagram's. Um, uh, all of those offices would have offices also had sculpture in them. And usually it was um, a mix of um, non-Western objects, utterly decontextualized um, as one might expect and a similarly scaled or looking, um, you know, modernist bronze. Um, and sometimes that was someone like Lipschitz or someone, sometimes that was, you know, it could be anyone. And I, I would say that sometimes they start to sort of look interchangeable. Um, uh, um, you know, the thing that's kind of particular about Moore is that many of these companies were considering more for major commissions on plazas. Um, and so, Often what happened was that there was an acquisition of a more work uh, that was associated with a plaza commission that sometimes wasn't uh, realized um, as part of the kind of courting process, um, sometimes as a study for something which, you know, in the end um, wasn't purchased for a plaza. Um, and sometimes those ended up in um, the, the offices of um, senior executives at companies. Um, is that helpful? That's super helpful. I'm sure you could speak at further length. But, um... Oh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, just a very quick, fantastic presentation again. Very quick one for, for Jay. Uh, the, the thing that everybody learns very quickly about Anthony Caro is that he was the guy who took the, the sculpture off the plinth and put it on the floor. And when you're talking about the independent group and the influence of American sculpture, I'm wondering where that came from. Is that something that you might associate with the independent group bringing art into everyday life, the This Is Tomorrow exhibition where you're walking around things, or is it actually something that comes from the, the, the micro-free tradition in, in the States? That's a great question, a really great point I hadn't even thought about, but I, 
you know, looking back at the independent group exhibitions, whether it's growth in you know, Hamilton's growth in form or parallel life and art, which is, you know, not on the ground, but sort of an all over, you know, all encompassing environment, you know, and this is tomorrow going into Henderson, you know, going into the shed where you see like, you know, sort of some sort of reference to some kind of apocalyptic scene where you dig into the sand and find these relics. So I think, yeah, that, that's a really excellent point that I need to, I'll need to think about and get your name so I can give you, you know, give you credit for the idea um, to think about how those, you know, those, um, those exhibitions and those ideas perhaps push Kara in that direction, you know, along with this idea too, that, you know, when you look at some of even Moore's pieces, they don't need the pedestal, you know, they have that, but it kind of would still feel okay on the ground. So I've been reckoned with that, uh, that idea of the, you know, getting rid of the plinth, but um, I think it's a really great idea. Thank you. Any further audience questions? Can I, oh, okay. Yeah, Thanks. Um, sorry, this is another question for Jay, if that's okay. I, I think there's a really interesting paradigmatic question at the center of your paper, which is, I'm going to try to pass it really quickly and easily, but if we look at David Smith, there are very few people who take seriously the idea that there's any substantial um, constructivism left in his work, right? It's cast as constructivism, that ethic has migrated to the United States to sort of die on the trash heap of capitalism and he's like wandering over this scrap heap and picking up pieces of scrap and recombining them. That tends to be the narrative that's repeated these days about Smith. So I'd like to know like what makes Caro different? Is it this British context where you have the new brutalism that seems to recast these materials sort of called back together into a useless object into something that's a potential for, for praxis, or like how, how do you navigate that theoretically? Great, that's one one point I wrote in my notebook as well. Like, where is David Smith in this, this discussion? Because you know he's also a father, you know, a father figure to Anthony Caro. Caro takes his steel after he, you know, after Smith dies in the car accident, and so there is this sort of other looming presence. In some ways, Caro is sort of pulled between these American and these sort of British uh, British forebears. So that's just sort of on the side there, but. I think your point is a good one and sort of, you know, what is the difference between Smith and Caro? And I guess like I'm no Smith expert either, but I think Smith, at least in terms of how, you know, Rosalind Krauss and others have, have, have talked about him is, you know, he is pictorial. Like he is, even his sort of sculptures from the forties, like Australia and others, they're very frontal, you know, you can walk around them, but they still have this sort of sense that they are, you know, they, um, you know, that they are, uh, they, they should be looked at from one sort of primary angle. Um, and also the ways they, until Greenberg got involved, Smith didn't want, did not want to paint his sculptures. So I think that idea of the painted steel that sort of takes these as found qualities to some sort of, you know, more refined level. But I think certainly, you know, I think you, if you'd put a, one of Smith's sculptures that had, far, you know, sort of remnants of farm equipment rusted in, Ron or Bonham's new brutalist sort of, you know, uh, page spread and architectural review, it would have fit just fine. So I think there's another, you know, much more to be done on Smith as well as sort of to find these other ways to look at his work that go, you know, beyond the refined sort of Greenbergian, Krausian ideas of, you know, of, of, of refinement. Um, but I'd love to hear what, um, what James and Alex think about David Smith's role in all of this as well. <laughs> I mean, I, the, I, the idea of um, uh, crystallizing Smith's reputation as I think the phrase was like, you know, wandering over the scrap heap of, in, of capitalism, was that it? Um, is such a great crystallization of what I don't know is ever said quite that um, succinctly, um, but I think is, is bang on the impression that I get from the scholarship. Um, and in, in all sorts of ways, I think that Smith, like Caro, can be understand, uh, can, it's productive to understand a kind of proto-pop sensibility in there simultaneously. Um, I don't think these need to be, you know, kind of diametrically opposed options as they have been in so much um, art historical discourse. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, drawing Smith into this conversation and thinking about his engagements with um, uh, found objects, with mass culture, 
um, could absolutely make sense within the territory that you're mapping out, Jay. Can I, I know we're slightly running out of time, so can I um, finish, unless anyone else has a burning question, some hands, no. Um, can I come back to you, James, and just ask you, yeah, I've, it's always kind of struck me that, I don't know whether, well, do you agree with this, that, that whether Moore has a particular relationship with his critics that is, is sort of so long standing across the 1950s and 60s, seems to be, sort of more than any other sculptor in this period, that critics sort of latch onto him and he, you know, vice versa. Um, and I wonder kind of why that is, or is it just that he, you know, knows how to use those relationships, or is there something else going on there? And, and do you think that with Sylvester in the 60s, do you think that, because Moore is sort of publishing his own writings in that period as well, do you think that anything comes into Moore's own words that is very distinctively sort of Sylvester, um, Sylvester's criticism, I suppose. Yeah, they're really good questions, thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, I wonder, I wonder, I mean, I don't know enough about, about Hepworth to say, to say, to kind of know if kind of there are parallels with kind of J.P. Hogan or, or anyone like that, or kind of, but it may, it may well be true that, that Moore really is kind of distinctive in the, the longevity of some of those relationships um yeah with people like Reed and and John Russell and, and Sylvester um and where might that be um I mean I think I think there is definitely kind of a, a real engagement with the work and I think that with I mean I think Sylvester is interesting to me because you do over the course of um a number of decades you do get a real sense of like the vicissitudes of what it means to kind of firstly like confront this artist as you know something of you know you know, like a, a, a kind of a, an, an idol and, a, and a, an exemplar, and then to kind of to work for him and to be around artists who are actually kind of trying to do something different and to be caught up in that and to try and be mediating between the two and then over kind of decades to be confronted by developments in Moore's um, practice, which kind of sometimes is very enthusiastic about, sometimes is, is clearly not, and that can map out very clearly across, you know, a dozen kind of reviews over the over the decades, and so um, and it's very interesting that he kind of ends up in 1968 with kind of having kind of reached this level where he can credit more with you know being hands off around you know the selection of his own um, major say gallery show. Um, so I mean I think that's that in itself is is a really kind of it's just a fascinating you know charts of a, of a relationship and I, I don't know enough about reads I mean maybe other people in this room know more kind of to, to say kind of how much that differs I mean my sense is kind of that read is kind of more probably kind of more unequivocally positive throughout is, is kind of my sense um, but there's less of that kind of writing as a weekly newspaper critic as Sylvester did and kind of he was having to wear simultaneously wear you know, different hats as both a curator and also kind of being someone who, you know, gave opinions um, as his job. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the second part about how much how much more took on anything from Sylvester. And, um, I mean, I, I'd be inclined to say nothing that I've noticed. Um, yeah, I think he, uh, yeah, I think he seems very much his, his own man as far as those things are concerned. And I think that the more that the more interesting thing for me, as I tried to explain in the paper, is how Sylvester kind of, as someone with his own very strong thoughts on what the most um, significant aspect of Moore's work is, is how he manages to kind of mediate and in, in these catalogue texts, from instances. And also, I mean, you can you can look at his interviews with Moore and the things that they talk about and the things that he asks Moore and you know where he tries to probe. And I think kind of those things are quite. Um, Quite um, kind of illuminating. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think um, we're looking to Sebastian now to close us with some remarks that bring us all together. <laughs> uh, not really remarks, just a big thank you to everyone. It's been a wonderful day. Uh, I feel really energised by. Uh, by all, all I've heard today, it's been um, 
a manifestation of one of our ambitions here at the foundation to broaden the conversation around anymore, to include the non-specialists <laughs> alongside the specialists. Uh, and, uh, and, and that ambition, I think, is, is going to carry on and, and become uh, sort of a habit here, uh, something that we are trying to establish. And I have to thank particularly Hannah for sort of being uh, uh, here to, 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 to facilitate these conversations and Tom um, for, for, for the support he's provided. Um, I have to say, I'm very impressed with the flawless handling of <laughs> technology today. Uh, it's been really remarkable. I, th I think it's, it's possibly the, the, the only thing that we can thank the pandemic for. <laughs> so we've, all, we've all become very, very good at using uh, this kind of technology. Um, of course, I would like to thank the speakers, the chairs, and, uh, and everyone who's participated in the conversation today. Uh, I, I think we've planted some really, really good seeds today for more conversations. I think there's, uh, it feels like the moment, uh, a beginning rather than kind of an end of the day. Uh, and, and I'm pretty sure that you know, over prints right now and in the coming days, weeks, months, and hopefully years, we can carry on with these conversations and uh, hopefully start collaborations and uh, keep talking about more and keeping relevant for ourselves and future generations. Thank you. <laughs>